If you're not good at selling, if you have this mindset block with selling, you got to get rid of it. The easiest way that I've found it possible to get access to a large amounts of money has been through. If you don't have the right mindset, the right discipline, the right habits, then you'll never get to the depth of the. If you want to be successful in life, all you have to do is If you're not good at selling, if you have this mindset block with selling, you got to get rid of it. You have to get rid of that. You have to realize you're still doing a good thing. You have to figure out how to not be salesy and, you know, be vulnerable with people, put the value out there. Listen, your job is to tell them about the products and help them solve their problems with these products and their job as an adult is to, to figure out if they want to buy it. You know, whatever your business is, so many people still have these blocks up, these mindset blocks of sales. They don't want to be salesy. They don't want to push people away. They're afraid to ask for the sale to close the deal. And it prevents success. When you don't really know what sales is, it can feel scary. Like so, I'll give that, but I don't think that once you realize what sales really is and the strategy and like, listen, we're just identifying the problem. We're giving them the solution to their problem with our product or our service. And we're saying, is it for you or is it not? It's really simple. And when you, when you break it down like that, without all of the stigma and everything, it's not scary. Tell me a little more about this idea of selling without being salesy. So in my mind, the salesy salesman is the one where you, you know, and everyone says, oh, that the car salesman, where you show up, they ask you no questions about anything and they just start selling to you. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what you want, what you're, maybe you've been already looking at something, what you need, they just start selling. And they're talking about something that you have no interest in. You're like, I, they're talking, they're trying to sell you this sports car and you're a mom or a dad with like four kids, you gotta get a van, right? And you're like, okay, stop. Like you don't even wanna get to know me to sell me what I really want or need. I don't want the minivan, but I don't have a minivan. Um, so that's like salesy, right? So not being salesy is really genuinely caring about someone and what they want and what they need. People buy what they want, not necessarily what they need. Mm -hmm. um, so caring about what they want, asking questions to learn more about what they want, and then figuring out if you have the solution for them. And if you do, you present that in an offer and then they buy or they don't buy. Sounds so simple. Why do you think, I mean, look, I get the, the whole card salesman smarmy stereotype, but like that's not how sales happens nowadays. So how is no. that prejudice and that stereotype even still a thing that pervades our consciousness that we're scared to just freaking sell? Because if nobody does that, then nobody can ever get paid. I think it's a fear, you know, and that's just what people, someone told a story once about someone that they heard through the telephone game. And so they're so scared that that's going to be them. They're worried about what someone's going to think. They're worried about pushing someone away. They're worried about looking like this or sounding like that. And it's really just fear coming up with all of the excuses in the world so that you don't have to step outside your comfort zone to get more comfortable in it and make the magic happen. I get that it's scary. But asking girls out was scary because yeah. same reason you don't want to get rejected. Right. Mm -hmm. But I wanted a girlfriend or I wanted a wife. So I overcame the fear. So that's what I don't understand is people want the thing, but, but I'm going to take the fear of the thing and turn it into an excuse instead of pushing through the fear of the thing. We do that with sales, but for some reason with like dating, we, we don't. So I'm curious, what do you think is the difference? How bad do you want it? You know, I think most people really want companionship bad enough to like get rejected. Right. You know, but like how bad do you want whatever it is that you want? And the people that don't want it bad enough, let fear take over their lives. How do you help people push through this fear? How do you, is it, do you have to help them want want it more, want the, the outcome more, 
or do you just, is it more like therapy where it's just like tackling the fear head on? Yeah, I think it's more like of a mindset thing. So I know that they want it. Like they wouldn't be paying me so much money if they didn't want it. So it's like, okay, what is the block here? And how are we going to move past this? Because it's really affecting your, you know, your monetary goal that you have, you know? So working through that and just having them kind of work backwards, like, why is this an issue? Can you think of a time where you like, got super jaded and we're like, oh my God, I never want to do that again. Like, let's talk through that. You know, what would happen if someone said no to you? I love the, and then what game for like anything Ooh. where they're like super scared about something. It's like, okay, so you're doing a stage presentation, you know, in front of thousands of people. What are you scared about? And then I'm going to forget my words. Okay. Well then what, <laughs> you know, then I'll just start talking about something else. Okay. And then what? And people will hate it. Okay. And then what? And like, at the end of that, you could go down as negative a path as you want. At the end of the day, you're still alive. You're still standing. Right. Right. And like, you can learn from it and move forward. So the, and then what game, you know, is always good to play. Um, you know, but also just figuring out what their mindset is around sales. And like, maybe they just really don't understand it and they don't know what sales is and means they think that it's stealing money from people's wallets giving them something they don't want like that's in their head about sales and it's like no you're adding value to your to that person's life you're giving them something that they want and that they need you're going to improve their life from that so let's shift your mindset and just attach sales to helping people because the more sales that you have the more you're helping people how did you get good at business? I mean, you said like you just, you didn't have the natural sales resistance, but there's a lot more to it than just being able to Mm -hmm. sell. So what was your, your sequence of getting good at this? A couple things. One, a growth mindset. So always wanting to grow, always wanting to get better. I've sought out coaches. I myself pay for coaches, various things, mindset coaches, business coaches, You know, I spent time watching videos, listening to shows like this, you know, learning as much as I could. Um, That's, that's one way to get better. Another way to get better is just to do it and fail and learn. And so things were not perfect in the beginning. I've made mistakes. I've hired the wrong people. I've set up the wrong programs. I've made, you know, decisions that were like, okay, that was not the best thing to do. I learned and got better and my business grew bigger. And now, you know, I help people try and avoid some of those mistakes, but, but failing is a part of the process. And so you have to be afraid not to fail because you're going to, you're going to do it. So the question is in your failures, are you learning? So I've basically with my mindset coach, we've basically redefined failure. And I've created this definition around failure that actually makes it impossible for me to quote fail. So my definition for failure is, you know, any time that I don't succeed at something and don't learn a lesson. And the reality is that every time I fail, I learn a lesson. So my brain is actually telling myself that I'm actually never failing at things. And that helps me keep going and push forward. Where do you steer people these days? as far as the best opportunities out there? Uh, 100% we have to look at what, not necessarily what you're good at, but what you find joy in. Yeah. You know, because if you're waking up to do something that you don't really enjoy, you're not going to push through the hard days. You're not going to move forward. So, you know, identifying something that you are maybe knowledgeable about, but you also enjoy. Um, So that's, you know, one avenue to do. My whole thing is I'm all about working less and enjoying and earning more. So the people that come to me for coaching, they want to scale back their working hours or make sure that their working hours are doing the stuff that they love, right? Um, You know, so it's helping them figure out what would you enjoy doing? What's kind of your core strategy that you coach people on to get more leverage? strategy first and foremost, building a business with purpose and intention. So being insanely intentional about everything that you're doing, 
uh, is something that I think a lot of people miss the boat on. They're just like doing all the things to, to try and do all the things and get somewhere. And there's no intention behind it. So mm -hmm. with what you're putting out right now, have you looked far enough ahead to where you want to be five years, 10 years to where there's intention and purpose behind what you're doing now to fuel what you plan to be doing in the future? Most people don't even think about that kind of right. stuff. But with my private clients, we sit down and we do, uh, you know, a goals, you know, session with their product suite. And we look at, all right, in a year, what do you want to do? What does your product suite look like now? Uh, you know, what's the journey that you're taking your clients on? Do we need to fill any of the holes? You know, and at the end of the year, what do you want to have created? And then that causes a ton of overwhelm because they're right, like, right. I have all these ideas and there's ah, so much that I want to do. And so we zoom out and then we zoom back in and we say, knowing what we know now and where you want to be at the end of the year, and you can even do this, you know, five years and go back to a year. And then, then we zoom back in and we say, what's that first thing? that you need to start doing to start the domino effect to lay those dominoes down so that at the end of the year you're there and it was you know it's not effortless but it feels effortless right it just kind of tees everything up to move forward so one of the things that i always hear you say i think it's actually how you close out your podcast is you say done is better than perfect Mm -hmm. um, I just want to, I just want to say, I, mean, I mostly just wanted to say that because it like, it's when I think of you, that rings in my ears and I'm like, yes, because when we talk about the rabbit hole, when we talk about the shiny object syndrome that so many people go down to me, that characterizes that as much as anything is that they do all this stuff and they never finish anything. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I assume that's a big part of what you're doing when you talk about working backwards and tripping the dominoes it's like what do you need to finish so you can get to the next thing that ultimately leads you to the big thing yeah it's literally the main thing that has helped me be so successful because if i got so stuck on perfectionism on ooh, like is this going to be good enough and all of that i never would have launched my own business and so many people are stuck in that. And I still like, I'm guilty of still finding myself, like wanting it to be really good. Like, oh my gosh, now I'm multi seven figure. Like I have this persona to like hold right. up and then I have to be like, wait a minute, Chrissy, what do you tell all of your people out there? Done is better than perfect. Get it out there. See what the market's going to say about it. You can go back and make tweaks and modify it but you're never going to take that next step forward and do the thing you want to do if you are just trying to be a perfectionist and trying to and comparing yourself to everyone else and trying to do it better like just do it just get it done to the point where you can you know have a buy button on it and just put right. it out there and then go back and make the changes that you want based on the feedback that you get the easiest way that i've found it possible to get access to large amounts of money has been through business credit cards and just about 13 months ago, I got my first business credit card. And before then, you know, I only financed my businesses with my cash, you know, never any, you know, any credit. It was always my cash. And I always look at other entrepreneurs that were scaling so fast. I'm like, how the heck are they scaling so fast? Like, you know, they must have a lot of money to get going. And then I found out, you know, the power of business credit where you can borrow money for free from the banks and then use that money to, you know, start scaling. And then when I started to go to mastermind events, you know, that's when I'm able to, you know, start meeting other investors, other people to partner up with. So kind of combining all of that, I think has really helped me get to where I am. And, you know, just in the last 13 months, I was just approved for about $450,000 in, in business credit going from zero business credit cards to over $400,000. And so now I'm just on the journey of teaching other people on these same strategies. The number one responsibility of an entrepreneur is raising capital all the time from friends, from family, from partners, from investors, even from your customers. Selling product is not selling product. Selling product is raising capital. And you should always be thinking that way as an entrepreneur. That's a Richard Branson. I think it was Richard. That's Branson. huge. Yeah. That's huge. I always tell people, the more you can borrow, the more you can make. 
right? The more yeah. you have access to, the more you can do, the more things you can invest in, the more you can invest into your company, into yourself. Like the more you have, the more you can do. And um, it's just in business for me, like I've had you know, a variety of different businesses now at age 27. And really it's been a night and day difference for me when I have access to more money. And you know, a year ago, over a year ago, I never had access to a large amounts of money. Never. You know, I was using my own cash. We did have that one loan in the travel business. But aside from that, I had no access to outside money. And then I, you know, I found business credit and I had, I had personal credit cards. Um, and then I found out business credit cards were different and so much more powerful. And so the first reason why they're powerful is because they don't report to your personal credit. So yeah. to give you an example, if you get a $40,000 credit card, business credit card, you can turn that credit into cash, put that cash into an investment, max the card out, and that, that utilization won't affect your personal credit. So you can do this over and over and over and over again. And, and that's exactly what I'm doing with, with so, so many cards in my hands right now. I'm just getting these massive card limits, using this money in many different investments. And then, you know, if you look at it in the standpoint of like, what's the safest way to invest when you have your own money versus the bank's money, it's so much safer to use the bank's money because one, it gives you more time to pay it back because it's 0% interest for 12 months, then you can balance transfer multiple times. Right. So it gives you more time to pay it back, which is obviously valuable. Two, if you do run into a, like an oh crap scenario and you can't pay it back and it goes to collections, you know there are ways and laws that protect consumers against that kind of stuff. And there are ways to get that debt removed from your credit file. Obviously that's the worst case scenario, but when you look at that scenario, it is so much better and so much safer than using your own money. People just need to be shown how to access it. And I, I cracked the code. I figured out how to become attractive to banks. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. And once you become attractive to banks, then it's just easy to get card approvals. Like I'm getting card approvals every week. I just got a 40K card approval two weeks ago. I got a $100,000 card approval this last week. And I'm putting that $100,000 on my e-commerce store. And then, you know, just transfer my, all my other credit over to other invest yeah. other businesses. It's amazing. And I think when you think about financing a business, there's really four ways, right? So you can finance your business with your own money, which as I previously talked about, I don't think that's a, the best idea, in my opinion. The second way is to bring on an equity partner where you give someone equity and they bring the money, but then you're giving away equity, giving away possibly control. Right. The third way is through a business loan and business loans are expensive. 10, 20% interest, um, you know, very common. You know, you're paying so much in interest, doesn't make sense. The fourth way, my favorite way, is just to finance your business through 0% interest business cards. And it's, so it's 0% for anyone that doesn't know, 0% interest for the introductory period. It might be nine months, 12 months, even up to 20 months on some cards. And then even if you can't pay it back in that time frame, you then balance transfer to another card. So in this scenario, you're borrowing money for free. You're keeping all the equity, which can make all the difference in the world. To some people, at least, they would probably say, well, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. Like you're just building this house of cards. But I mean, you and I both know at the end of the day, it comes down to personal integrity. You either manage it responsibly or you don't. But how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you address that concern? And then how do you actually work with people if you do to like not be idiots? I mean, it, business is hard. There's risk in every business. But at the end of the day, it's like, do you want to use your own money or do you want to use someone else's money, which has less risk? You know, so I think it, it really comes down to just analyzing the risk, meeting the good people that I was mentioning before, you yeah. know, go to mastermind events, network, you know, find these good people to partner with and, you know, make your best judgment. But I think the only way to create financial independence is you have to you have to put yourself out there. You have to risk things. You have to spend money to make money. And I think if people are not investing, if they're not putting themselves out there, they're, they're not going to create success. They're not going to, you know, some things you fail on. And honestly, a lot of things that I fail on, I embrace because any failure is makes me stronger for the next opportunity. So, you know, don't look at failure as a bad thing, but, you know, go with your best judgment, find the best people that you can find, make sure your contracts are good. And you know, I really think the more money you have access to, the more money you can make. And one thing I will add, Jeff, is when you're using business credit to invest into these things, whether your business or these other investments, I like to put my, my cash into long-term investments. So like cryptocurrency, the stock market, real estate, 
So while that is appreciating long term, I'm using the business credit to invest into short term investments, right? Investments that yeah. are going to make a return in 12, maybe 24 months. Because, you know, why not? I can borrow money for free from the bank at 0% interest for 12 months while my cash is in long term investment. So, you know, while the, the short term investment is moving forward, at least my cash is still appreciating in the market. You know, so say like you have $10,000 that you could have put in, you know, Bitcoin back in September and you could have borrowed 10 grand to put into your, your investment. Now you have 20 grand working for you. That 10 grand investment in Bitcoin just turned to like, you know, $60,000. And now this investment is probably going good as well. So it just diversifies your, your risk and gives you more opportunity to make more money. Here's, I think the trap people have, or the, sort of the fallacy of people's thinking is they're like, well, well, what do I need the money for? So I'm not going to, so they're like, well, I'm not going to go proactively get access to capital until I need the capital. But I mean, I'm sure your experience is the same as mine. By the time you need, when you need capital, it's usually too late to secure capital. You should be working on getting access to capital when you don't have a pressing need for it. Because frankly, if you, have a, if, you, if you have a pressing need for it, whether it's a timeline or a, a sense of lost opportunity, that urgency is usually going to hurt you. You're going to end up paying more because banks and lenders, they can literally feel your desperation. You should yeah. be getting it when you don't need it. Yes. So then when you walk into that mastermind or that networking event, you know, it's like walking around with a letter of credit. You know that if the right deal happens, you've got the, you can play. And you're not, that, you're not you're not sitting there feeling like you're wasting people's time talking about hypotheticals of like, well, tell me what you got, and then I'll go see if I can get the money. Because that that guy at the that guy at every event, that he's there, and nobody likes that guy. Hundred percent, Jeff. <laughs> you you have to be prepared, and it takes a lot of time to get to that point. So I think even when people don't have you know things in mind, like you're mentioning, it's so important that you you take the actions and prepare yourself. So when those opportunities come, you can take advantage. You know, just two guys I met from the mastermind event I, I went to over this weekend. One for the oil wells. I just met with them this morning, probably investing here tomorrow. Another guy manages a, a $10 million Forex fund and you know, the minimum is pretty high. But because I've taken the, you know, the, the actions to prepare myself, I'm able to you know, invest in both opportunities. So, you know, step one is get access to the funding, which, you know, I'm a big advocate of doing that through business credit cards. And then, you know, two, go to these mastermind events and meet people to, you know, to invest with or to partner with. And so, you know, a lot of people, you know, it's, it's sometimes very hard to think of ideas, think of business ideas yeah. or find these good investment opportunities. But those are probably the same people that aren't putting themselves out there and go into these networking events. So, you know, go meet people, go meet investors, um, get access to money. And I think things are going to be a lot easier. You can go to any event in any major city on any day of the week. And there's going to be like 20 guys in a room somewhere who all have multi-million dollar whatevers that they're needing partners or capital or something. And you just got to be putting yourself out there and finding those rooms. So, so how do you, A, how do you find those rooms? And B, how do you, what, what's your process for due diligence when you do to make sure you don't end up putting borrowed money into a bad deal? Yeah. I mean, great question, Jeff. So, I mean, to find those rooms, you know, follow people on social media, whether it be YouTube, Instagram, or Facebook, that are doing things that you want to do. You know, people that are living the lifestyle that you want to live, follow those people and, you know, take whatever courses or, you know, free resources that they have and start, you know, consuming the content that they put out. And oftentimes when they host events, you know, go to these events. Don't be, don't be scared to pay money to get in the room. I have spent tens of thousands of dollars on courses, on mentorships, on live events, um, you know, just to meet people, right? And through paying, it's basically paying to play, right? You need to pay to get into these rooms. And when, you know, everyone else is paying, it brings a certain demographic of people. So I think it's really important you you make it to these events uh, to meet people. And if you can make it to the events, at least, you know, start following these influencers on, on social media and seeing what they're putting out and start, you know, start buying their courses, right? You need to start thinking like the people that you look up to, right? So find these people that have the life, that you want or doing the things that you want in life and start trying to you know, replicate what they're doing. One of the questions you asked that I actually forgot to answer was how do you make sure you're putting your money in good hands? Yeah, the due diligence. Like, really like when I invest, I'm not even specifically investing in the business model. I'm investing in the person, yeah. right? So for these two people that I'm investing 
in like today and tomorrow, you know, I'm investing in the people, right? I hung out with them all weekend. I went to dinners. I went, you know, I got coffee with them the next morning just to talk and, you know, build a friendship. Um, you know, you want to build these relationships with people and the more you trust them, you know, the, the better they're going to take care of you. And so as long as the business model to me makes sense and checks out and it really looks like a good way for me to multiply my money, you know, that, that's fine, but I'm really investing in the person, you know, so go meet people, go, you know, invest to, you know, buy people dinner, you know, go get out there and network. And that, that combination with having access to money is really going to get you far. What would you say a person should be looking for and filtering against in evaluating deals and or the people behind the deals? Jeff, you have such great questions, man. I think when it comes to that, you just, you really need to, you know, try to spend as much time with that person as you can and look for, you know, traits, character traits that you really admire, you know, you know, like that person being nice to other people saying that, saying the right things, um, not going back on his word on anything, um, you know, lo really look for these really admirable character traits. And I think that's where I really find trust with. We should take note from the banks. Banks are the best evaluators of risk in the world. And if they're primarily obsessed with, let's call them the soft qualities, the human qualities of the people that they're lending to, that's what we should be obsessed with. And yet so many of us, we get, we get enamored with the deal. And we, for, and we forget about, we forget to study the deal maker. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, man. And I think like when you really look at what banks are looking for in, in people to lend to, they're really looking for people they trust, right? Mm -hmm. And so when, when I help people build credit, I'm helping them become attractive to the banks. And there's a lot of things you have to do to win that trust. Yeah. You know, one of the, you know, the key things that people don't really realize is you should really have banking relationship with these banks before applying for the business credit cards. So even things like you know, going to the banks and opening up you know, business checking accounts, that's absolutely huge. Go open up a business checking account put some money in the account and start seasoning that account. You know, that's, that's building the relationship with the bank, just like, you know, building a relationship with someone you just met over a meal, you have to season that relationship with the bank. And the longer you do this, the more favorable they're going to treat you before getting the business credit cards. There's a lot of things you have to do on the personal credit side. So you really want to have at least four primary accounts on the personal credit side and also a banking relationship with the bank you want to apply for a business card at. So I always focus on the top tier banks first. This is like Chase Bank, US Bank, and Bank of America. And what you want to do is start doing your personal banking at Chase Bank because they're the heaviest in relationships. And if you have a business, you want to open up a business checking account at these three top banks and start seasoning these accounts. And so even if you don't actually have like a business business, at least like file an LLC, that's going to be a consulting business, right? Very broad, very generalized. But because you have this LLC, it's going to allow you to get business credit cards. And even if you don't have a lot of revenue or any revenue, you can still get approved for cards based on your estimated revenue, as long as your personal credit is strong. And so what I mean by strong is you want to have at least four primary personal accounts, you don't want any late payments. And when you say accounts, you mean credit accounts, like opening consumer credit cards or Correct. furniture Correct. store cards or something. Any retail cards, credit cards, um, auto loan, okay. mortgage, you know, personal accounts like those, at least four. More the better. Um, when it comes to utilization, you want to make sure that's at least under 30%, but ideally under 10%. And then when it comes to actually applying for the cards, you want to make sure you have no more than two hard inquiries on each of the three bureaus. And each bank is gonna pull from a different bureau based on your location in the country. So and one of the big resources I have is it shows people what banks pull from what bureaus. So part of the, the credit stacking strategy that I have is to really essentially play Tetris with these hard inquiries on the bureaus. So you can get the most amount of cards in, in the shortest period of time. But as long as you kind of fit those general requirements and have the business checking account open with that bank, and ideally you have some money in that account, I would recommend to go into the branch to then apply for the business checking account, or sorry, for the business credit card, at least about a week after you put the money in. And like I said, the more money in the account for sitting, you know, more time, the better. And then always do it in person because online, there's so much credit card fraud that goes on. 
there's a lot of denials that happen. And then even if you get denied for a card, you don't want to accept that denial. You want to Google chase reconsideration phone number and you want to call that phone number and you want to ask them to reconsider mm -hmm. the decision. Let them know like, Hey, I just got denied for this card. You know, I really, you know, really want to build a relationship with chase. Can you guys please reconsider the decision? Um, that, that works very well. And even if it doesn't work the first time, you know, politely end the call, call back again, talk to a different rep, do that multiple times. We've seen this work many times where if it doesn't work on the first call, it could work like the fourth, fifth or sixth call. You know, first of all, the thing I want to say is I did my own research and this is all totally legal. Like a lot of people think that sounds like some kind of fraud or brinksmanship. It's just, it's just intelligently using the financial system. hundred percent. And I think like when you're trying to really maximize your benefits, you really want to know what to apply for, when to apply for and how to apply for. So mm -hmm. I kind of went over how to apply for, um, but when to apply for is, is very important. So it really depends on how many personal accounts, personal credit card accounts you have opened in the last six months. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have over two open in the last six months. So generally when I do these credit stacks every quarter, I'm only doing one to two personal cards every quarter because one, it allows me to then apply for more cards sooner because the business accounts don't report to their personal credit. So when you go to other banks, they can't see you just open up that business account. And so when, when I get a $20,000 limit at Chase, when I go to Amex, Amex can't see what Chase just gave me because that business credit card doesn't report to the personal credit. Right. They only can see the personal credit, which is incredible. And so even after we get approved for you know like eight cards in one day, we then are able to remove some of the inquiries from those open business cards, which is incredible. And that allows us to go for another credit stack um, in about two, three months. For Joe Average to do this the optimal way, not like the, the fast, let me cut corners in a hurry way, but like the optimal way, how long should he give himself? And, and I say Joe Average, it can be Janet Average, it's a he, she, it's not a gender biased thing. Like two years? A yeah, year? I mean, what do you think? I mean, between one and two years is very fair. It really depends on what history he already has with the top banks. Like how long has he been banking there? It will determine on how many personal cards he has already exactly. with what limits. Even if he has low limits, there's things you can do that we, we can increase his limits. And it's all about comparable credit. So if you have high limits, it's easier to get other high limits. And even if you have lower limits, but you're using the cards, there's ways to get all of those limits increased, which is going to help you get more cards in the future. Um, it also depends on what you know, kind of revenue he has in the business, what type of business, um, how his business is set up. You know, some businesses are um, much easier to get funding for, like consulting companies, for example, e-commerce stores, for example. Even if you had um, a wholesaling real estate business, instead of um, having the category as real estate for the entity setup, you want to have like marketing agency because right. banks don't want to lend money to a real estate company. They want to lend to a marketing agency, right? And if you're a wholesale company, you're just, you're getting leads for, you know, real estate, real estate deals. So it's all about, you know, all these different things come together. Yeah. And even if you have a new business, you can get a lot of funding for a brand new business. One of the big factors is your history, right? So how long have you had your personal credit cards open for, you know, more age, the better. How long have you been at banking at Chase, at Bank of America, things like that. One thing that took me a long time to realize was you never want to close credit card accounts. Yeah. The longer you have them open, the better. I never, I didn't know that until like, you know, three, like three, literally two years ago. It was like, you know, honestly, pathetic thinking about that, but I would get these cards, get the massive sign up bonus. And then after I got the sign up bonus, I would close them, then get more. So I had this, I had very short history at yeah. first. And then I realized like, okay, you shouldn't actually close them. You should keep them open. So, and even if you have a card that you have an annual fee on and you don't want to pay it, just ask them to downgrade you to the, to the option that where you don't have to pay. So you, you still keep that credit account open. Now you're yeah. just not paying. We're in a weird place in the world right now. We're in a place where uh, entrepreneurship and success is something you truly have to learn on your own because it's not taught in school. It's not taught by most people. And it's only about 2% of the world that has the nerve to gain the capabilities, take uncomfortable action and own their future. So I love making people feel disturbed mm. within action.
Because yeah. listen, at the end of our lives, when we look back, if we didn't go after it, we're not going to say, I'm so glad I played it small. I'm so glad I didn't go after my dreams. I'm so glad I let someone else own my future. You're not. You're going to be at the end of your life saying, shit, what the hell did I do? I want, I want to redo. It's like, no, this is our time. Gain these capabilities and go out there and be courageous moving forward. For where we are in the world right now, where do you steer these people now? What's your advice? So let me answer that in two ways. One is I think we need to go upstream a little and realize that when the world shifts like it has, I look at it, you've heard this saying forever, Jeff, if when one door closes, another one opens. Yeah, we get that. But here's what most people do. They stand at the door that's closed and locked, jiggling the handle, dying for it to come open and complain in their head or their, or their subconscious or their inner self-doubt. It's like, God damn it, I want this door to open. Who would shut this door? I need someone to open it back up. I want life to be the way it was. But do you really? You know, one thing COVID did, it, Warren Buffett says, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. Let's look at it. The tide went out when COVID came. And when you really look at it, did you, were you really living the life you thought you'd live when you were a kid? Were you really living into your full potential? Are you really living a life that at the end of your days, if you got a chance to sit with your maker, you could say, I was living a fulfilled life. I loved my job. I loved someone else squashing my dreams, or I love being in the time and effort community, or I love being around a boss that never let me have my freedom or not being in control. Most people didn't like it. If you use COVID, lots of bad came from it, but what good came from it, it exposed your life. You had time to sit and reflect. So so many of you are still jiggling the damn door handle, waiting for a life to open back up that may never be the same. The world's not going to be the same. And if it did, do you really want it? The other way is knowing that we must go pivot, explore, investigate new ways where the world is shifting. Yes, some industries are going down. Some are exponentially growing. And so many of you already have assets, skills, things that you could do from home that can allow you to impact other people's lives and create success. So the first thing I wanna share if I'm going upstream, like fixing the diabetes with diet and exercise is know when the world shifts, most people freeze waiting for someone to fix it. You have an unfair advantage if you turn, pivot and look for another door that's open. You are amongst the two, 3% that are scared, taking courageous, uncomfortable action, but you'll find what's next. And then the tactical side, what Tony and I have been sharing is the industry you're in, Jeff, now and I'm in, and I've been in for 20 something years, Tony for 40 something years of being in the self-education industry, being a part of the digital economy, sharing an experience, a passion, a hobby, a skill, a, a mess that became your message, helping people get through or discover what you've already experienced and it's one of the fastest growing industries in the world, right? I mean, according to Forbes, the self-education industry, that means going online and paying for a course or a workshop or a mastermind or a Zoom call and learn from someone who's already been there. That industry is heading towards a billion dollars a day by 2025. And we're just kind of shaking the trees saying, self-education is what changed my life. If it wasn't for me being introduced, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be on your podcast. I wouldn't be a multiple New York Times bestselling author. I wouldn't be to donate and impact and all the things I do. So um, shifting, pivoting, exploring simultaneously, there's industries like the knowledge industry, the, the self-education industry that is exponentially growing. And that's why we're teaching people how to be a part of it. None of us were born in the self-education industry. None of us were born to teach others. It is something that's created through time, through your life experiences, because someone else needs it, right? And the world has shifted. They're not, people aren't going back to college. College is struggling. They've, college has grown linearly and the world is growing exponentially. Not much has changed. So people don't want to go back to college when they want to start their own thing. And we also know that you can't learn through your own trial and error fast enough because the world is moving too fast. So what's the end result is learn from someone who's already been there. So this is what I'd love to share with you guys at home. When, I, when people ask me, tell me why the self-education industry, what am I going to share with people? And I say this, if you had a week to prepare, I want you to think of everybody listening. Think of your 20 year old self. Where did you live? What did you wear? Like I can remember what I wore at 20 years old, about where I was. Think of a place where you would sit at your family's house or outside or a park. And think if you had a week to prepare and you got to spend two hours with your 20 year old self, two hours. 
And you got to share like, oh my God, when it comes to your dreams, don't let people squash them. Here's the three things. When it comes to relationships, when it comes to making money, when it comes to business, oh my God, like tell Jeff, you telling your 20 year old self, oh my God, when it comes to business, you think it's this, it has nothing to do with that. It's this, it's these four things. I want you to focus on this. And I do this in front of 20, 30,000 people. And I always say, especially when we're on Zoom and I'll say, what would that be worth to you to spend two hours with your 20 year old self? And there's only two answers, millions or priceless. Because priceless could mean I'd fix this relationship that didn't work or I wouldn't have got involved in it. But business, it's like millions, right? right? So I said, think about this. You've had life experiences. You are a chapter ahead. There are potentially millions of people starting off where you left off like your 20-year-old self that you could teach how to, how to avoid the divorce. Or if you do, put your children first. Or the mess of losing a business because you didn't understand finances or how to scale or how to market or how to sell or how to cut hair or how to do a million things. Tony and I are working. We have, we have people in 156 countries with 5,200 different niches sharing their experience. So if you think about that, is you've experienced something and some of it's a mess, some of it's a skill, some of it's an expertise, some of it's in business, some of it's in life. You found a way to be empowered. You found a way to eat vegan. You found a way to meditate. And someone else is right now online looking for someone they can pay to show them how to go faster. They're on, you're on the other side of this learning curve and you can supply the bridge. And that's the self-education industry. People that are willing to share their knowledge, their experience to allow someone to go faster, but simultaneously, it's heading towards a billion dollar a day industry. So I hope that kind of gave you a, a kind of a, a, a view of why we're so bullish and so passionate about helping people. The world has shifted that we need specialized knowledge, not general knowledge. And schools are still teaching general knowledge. You take 20 different classes, even though you want to do one thing. All the way back, Napoleon Hill wrote in the 30s, he wrote general knowledge, no matter how vast and how, how much you gain of it will never accumulate to wealth. The, 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 uh, Ginny Romney, the CEO of IBM a couple of years ago said the hell with college degrees. I want people who have specialized knowledge. I don't care about all the stuff. I want somebody who went deep on one thing. And how do you learn specialized knowledge? The world has shifted. If you want to learn something, you can Google a million things, but when you want to find specialized knowledge to run a business, to scale a business, to go to another level, to create freedom in your life, to overcome the inner self doubt and that imposter syndrome. You know what crushes imposter syndrome? Someone like Jeff, myself, Tony, someone who pulls back the curtain and says, this is how I got here. Don't avoid these pitfalls, do more of this. And uh, I, I look at it as a straight line going down rather than this wide, vast general knowledge. My daughter, who is 14, um, it's already a part of her culture, Jeff, right? She wanted to learn, she loves to doodle and art, do artwork. And she said, you know, I want to learn oil painting. She didn't think about going to a class or going to school, like literally went online, went on to actually one of our platforms, found a guy, Anthony, that was doing weekend Zoom trainings on how to do oil paintings for like 97 bucks. She said, dad, can I get a credit card? I'll use it towards my allowance. I want to take this class. I didn't, I just handed her my credit card and like, Two weekends later, I walk into the kitchen. We we're in our, 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 our house up in the, in the mountains when it was really hot. Um, I walk into the kitchen and she's got her laptop open. She's got a canvas and she's taken education from a guy who's not a college educated guy. He was just an artist his whole life. She liked his style and the guy's doing weekend Zoom calls and he's got, you know, 50 people on that paid him 97 bucks each. My daughter, one of them. And I'm like, this is where the world's going. That's why I want to shake everybody and say, you could either ignore it, or you could be a part of it, impact people's lives and simultaneously create success for yourself. Like what are some of the qualitative stuff that self-education can and does talk about that college can't or won't? Yeah. What a great question. You know what I love, Jeff? I love when someone asks me a question or thinks so deep about something that it's new to me. So thank you for, thank you for that. And I see why you have a great following and a loyal, a loyal audience. Um, what I think is if you look at life, right? In most cases, and, and think about this, those of you at home or wherever you are right now, listen to this. When you think about going to the next level, it doesn't mean your, your back's against the wall, but wherever you are, you think of the next level. A lot of times our brain thinks how and who can, how and the tactic strategy or tool to get there. But now at 52 years old, I realize that the tool or the tactics or the strategies, though important, I love strategy. Being a strategist is something that I'm, I'm passionate about and laying out the funnel, laying out the framework, laying out the process. 
But what I realized at this age, and so do you, Jeff, I'm sure, is that if you don't have the right mindset, the right discipline, the right habits, the right morning routine, then you'll never get to the depth of the effort you need to do to make it work. I believe most people, sorry to have a silly sports analogy, but I think most people give up on their businesses or their dreams or their life goals at the five yard line. They don't realize they're an inch away. They have the, they have the capabilities, they have the opportunity, they live in an area where there's no limits. We're in a time where we're connected to the whole entire world. We had 837,000 people on a challenge. Oh my God, right? We're connected. But what happens, what gets in your way is an old belief or you're married to someone you love, but they look through the lens of half empty and they're telling you it won't work and we're going to fail and we're going to lose everything. And that hits something that your father told you when you were seven years old. If you don't have the, the discipline, the habits, the, the again, I say in the same thing, the morning routines, that allow you to overcome the mindset, then you'll give up on the five yard line, not realizing you'll think it was the tool or the tactics when actually it was an old belief that you didn't squash. So the cool thing about, about self-education is you get the opportunity to shift your mindset so you become unstoppable. And then when you implement the tool, nothing can stop you. Just think about the simple things in life. Has anything in your life worked well if you're not committed, right? Relationships, do they work if you're not committed? If you're texting or DMing or talking to other people, it never works. No. If you say you're going to the gym, but you really go there and sit on the edge of the bench and you scroll through Instagram, you tell your friends you went to the gym, but you know you really didn't do crap. Does it work out for you? When you say you're eating good, but when no one's watching, you're, you're eating the things that, fill, that make you overweight or make you unhealthy. Nothing has ever worked in our lives when we're not committed. But sometimes people dabble in business and want to be entrepreneurs and expect it to get the results. And here's the thing. Last thing I want to share on this is the next five years of your life is going to happen anyway. The next five years, you're going to have disappointment. The next five years, you're going to be let down. The next five years, things are going to go wrong. The next five years, your inner subconscious is going to make you doubt yourself. You're going to feel like an imposter. All of those things are going to happen anyway. But here's what I know. You could have all those feelings in five years now and still be in the same exact place as you are now. And how would that feel if in five years you were exactly where you are? Or you could take the next year, five years, and go deeper in your entrepreneurial journey, deeper towards your success, deeper on your solopreneurship or taking your business to a next level. You're still going to have all those emotions, but on the other side, you're not still in a time and effort community and allowing someone else to own your future. You own your future. You own the next level. You get to make decisions. So you got the next five years happening anyway. You might as well find that thing, pivot, shift, close that door, leave that door closed that closed in front of you and go explore. How do you counsel people? Not just, okay, here's a clue to what it is, but like, here's how you go out and slay that dragon so that you can be- I got it. I, I know. What is it? Yeah, tell me. For me, I just, I only can go through my eyes because there's a million answers. Jeff, we could both sit here for another three hours and give answers, but here's what I believe. If you say I could be a millionaire, I could scale my company, I could start my company, I could live on my own, I could do this, but usually the but is your story, right? And we know that you've heard this before. I'm not the first time sharing. Jeff's probably shared this in a really elegant way with you. Your story of why it won't work, where you live, your age, technology, don't have money, don't have time. Your spouse doesn't believe in you. You failed before. You're a procrastinator. I don't know what it is. But that story is the only thing holding you back from where you are to where you want to be, right? We know that. But here's what I would love for you to think about it as we get to the end here. How do you get disturbed with that story? Because right now you're giving that power to something that's bullshit. Because you could go Google 100 people that started broke, no education, didn't go to high school, parents didn't believe them, physically abused, sexually abused, live in the wrong area, immigrant, got made fun of, was a nerd, broke, divorced, unhappy spouse. You could find, you could go Google people right now with whatever ails you that they went on to reach their full potential and live a good life. So the story's bullshit. It just, as I say that you might go, oh, Dean, you're wealthy now you're happy. But I had all those stories, all of them. And I had to elegantly bust. I don't even know if it was elegant. I had to find a way to break every one of those stories. And here's how I did it. I saw the power of what that story did on me. I felt its weight of holding me back. And here's how I look at it. I'd pretend it's five years from today and nothing's changed in your life. And if you're not climbing, you're sliding. So it probably got a little worse. You have a little bit less money. You dream bigger, but the dreams seem farther away. You, you didn't 
you didn't spend more time with your family. You're not the dad or the mom you thought you'd be. You don't have the freedom or time. Someone else owns your future. How would that feel in five years from now if that story was the reason you didn't go after it? Can you fail? Hell yes. I failed more times and Jeff would probably agree. I've failed miserably. I've doubted myself. I've had sleepless nights. I've said, you're a fool. Why would you try? But I get up and go after it again because I deserve to be in control. My children deserve a better version of me. My wife deserves a better version of me. My team deserves a better version of me. So I keep that, that uncomfortable action going forward. So all I can say is if you let that story rule your life in five years from now, life will be the same. And how would that feel? How would it feel in 10 years from now? Here's the last thing I'll say. I said, if you had, at the end of your life, you had the chance to meet your maker. And this is not me saying, I've heard this from someone else a decade ago and it floored me. What if you got to sit down with God or whoever you believe in and God says, thank you, I'm, I'm glad you're here and I have five minutes for you. So tell me about your life. And you say, I was gonna go after it, but you know, my, my wife didn't believe me. My, my husband thought that wasn't the right thing. It was the wrong time, the wrong president, the wrong economy. And all of a sudden, God said, wow, I, I wish you would have went after it. But can I just show you, um, I know you lived this life, but I just want to show you who you could have been. Hmm. Could you imagine if God showed you who you could have been by taking that uncomfortable action, by busting that stupid lie of a story? So whatever it takes for you to be disturbed, literally be disturbed by this. Be disturbed at the end of your life, you won't be the man, the woman you were destined to be. Be disturbed you're not tapping into the full potential. Do whatever it takes to crush that story and then replace it with an empowering story. I didn't have anything. So my story, I switched it from I'm an underdog with nothing to I don't have resources, but I'm going to be resourceful as hell. And I'm going to learn it, figure it out and move forward. That was my story. That was my shift. You got to find yours. There are really two different types of millionaires. There is the millionaire who is a financial killer and they've got a great business and they got a bunch of commas and zeros in their bank account, but they're bankrupt in their health. They are bankrupt in their relationship with their spouse or their partner. They're estranged or they're bankrupt in their relationship with their kids, with their employees. They don't give back to charities or causes outside of just serving themselves. But then I realized there were other millionaires who not only live purposefully, intentionally disciplined um, in how they ran their business and built their wealth, but they lived as equally as intentional and purposeful and live like a millionaire in their marriages and with their kids and in their businesses and in their right communities and the list goes on and on. So I wanted to study the whole life millionaire yeah. and how are they taking this holistic approach of discipline and focus and goal setting and purposefulness and not just the financial pillar of their life and garden, but in all gardens of life. And, and at the end of the day, what I realized was almost every single one of them, at least that, you know, were financially abundant, but also extremely abundant in every other area of their life were extremely purposeful and curious about how to take and enhance their health and their nutrition to another level because they knew that when they were physically optimized, it ultimately made them mentally optimized, which those two vice versa kind of feed off one another. And when one of those is off, um, it at the end of the day showed in their performance in other gardens of their life. So for me, I've always been very intrigued on what other people are doing and how they're doing it and just trying to be my own experimentation on what works and what doesn't. As entrepreneurs, as business owners of people who have big goals and dreams and aspirations, it's what we're always going to be designed to do. We want to know what is next, right? And so for me, I said, you know what? I, I'm a rhythm and a framework guy. Um, I like having guardrails because I'm a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type of guy, right? Like when shit's good, it's good. When it's bad, I'm going dark, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I needed to know when I'm operating and when you feel like, and we all know kind of when you feel like you're in that flow state, right? Of like, man, I feel this momentum. There's nothing that can bring me down. I'm dialed in. I'm the Terminator. Whatever gets put in front of me, I'm taken down, Right. Um, and I said, I've never really taken inventory of what's going on in my life, what's going on in my routine, what does my rhythm look like when I'm operating at that level? And I'm a big awareness guy, because when we're more aware on what's going on, and we're clear on what that is, we can either get in and double down on what we're doing to crush it, or we can maybe course correct or tweak or pivot or optimize um, if things aren't working according to plan, right? 
And so I took inventory of when I'm operating at what I just called 90% or better. And there were really these 10 things that I wrote down. And I would encourage anybody to go when you're in that flow state, when you feel dangerous and weaponized in life or in business, health, relationships, all areas, right? What is going on? And for me, it was I'm eating clean and healthy. Usually I'm doing some type of intermittent fasting, um, whole foods. I'm getting six to seven hours of sleep a night. I'm working on projects that I'm extremely passionate about and enthusiastic about, which really that energy flows into all other areas of my life through and beyond my work. Um, I'm working with world-class talent who I have fun with and who challenge me and who inspire me. So who are you surrounding yourself with as you're doing those things? I'm making money. Let's be honest. I love making money. And when I'm, you know, making money, everything seems to feel and be better, right? Um, my morning and my evening routines are dialed in. I'm working out consistently and challenging myself physically. I'm emotionally, spiritually, and physically connected to my wife. And I am playing full out as a father and getting quality time and creating memorable moments with my daughters. And so when those things are happening in my life, I'm pretty dangerous. I'm pretty happy. I'm pretty fulfilled. I'm pretty purposeful and productive. And I notice that when I feel like something's a little bit off or I'm slipping somewhere, I can literally go back to every single one of these pillars and, and usually spotlight something that is slipping and is bleeding into other areas of my life slipping too. But knowing at least what my peak performance is, I then can be a little bit clearer and more purposeful when I'm aware things are off. What do I need to go plug back into that I know will at least allow me to swing that pendulum back and create that momentum going back in the right direction? At the end of the day, everybody has a different definition or vision of what living a rich life looks like. Um, for me, it consists of these kind of four pillars though. R in rich stands for relationships. So having very purposeful personal and professional relationships. I having very intentional and purposeful plans around your income and your investments. So your active income and your passive investment vehicles. Then you have C, your community and contribution. So who do you surround yourself with? What are you plugged into? Mastermind groups, chamber of commerce, whatever it is, right? And other causes and charities beyond just serving yourself. Mm -hmm. And then H, health, mental, physical, and spiritual, right? And that can encompass a lot, but that's my definition of a rich life. And then obviously everybody under those categories can design different goals and approaches and intentions behind those things. But I like to use frameworks because- life's complicated. And there's so many different hooks and so many different distractions that are going to pull you in so many different directions all the time. And if you can have frameworks that are kind of like what I call the bumpers to my bowling alley of life, mm -hmm. you know, I want to make sure that I'm not bowling gutter balls and I'm at least hitting pins down. And when I'm in the zone and I know what I need to do in terms of my rhythm, I'm probably going to be hitting strikes and spares here and there. But Without those frameworks, right, it's very easy for people to just get caught up in the, you know, what I call the vortex of life. And um, it's one of those things where if you don't have purpose and intention and kind of guardrails around the things that you know you need them for, you most likely won't, you know, ultimately optimize what you're capable of doing, whether it's in your health or your relationships or any area of life. So I'm a big rhythm guy. I'm a big routine guy. I'm a big framework guy because I've never been the, the fastest, smartest, or strongest. I'm usually good at modeling after people who are and applying that into my own unique journey based on what my goals are, what am I trying to accomplish and by when. And then from there, I can kind of reverse engineer with those frameworks, the best routines, the best goals, the best resources that are all aligned and congruent with that. Um, but you got to be clear. And like you said, there's got to be that awareness around what it is that you're actually going after. And then what is the best, you know, plan and accountability that you can bake into that for your own life. So that way you're building those stepping stones or what I call the breadcrumbs of life along the trail that you can keep following to get to your destination. It's not going to be flawless. We're all, you know, flawed human beings, but if you can give yourself those guardrails and those frameworks to plug into, you're going to have that much more likely of succeeding at what you're trying to accomplish. Daily life is messy and chaotic and distracting and confusing and we get tired. 
And it's already, it already has to have been thought out ahead of time. Yeah. Or else we're not going to do it right in the moment. Yeah. You're, you're spot on. I know uh, one of my mentors, Jeff Hoffman, um, he always says, you know, don't chase money, chase excellence. The excellence chases the money, right? Or the, the money chases the excellence. And so, you know, for me, I, again, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. So I like to create very simple frameworks. I'm an executor. I work hard, right? So those are a lot of things where I'm not the LeBron James who's, you know, just got that natural God-given talent. I have certain God-given talents, but at the end of the day, there are a lot of other things holistically that make up this whole package of life for me. And so um, I try and surround myself with people that are way smarter than me. Um, and I've just always had the belief in myself. One of my early mentors told me, if you want to be successful in life, all you have to do is be dumb enough to believe in yourself every single day and smart enough to take action on those beliefs. And so for me, I've just had a lot of failing forward moments um, in my life. And I've had a lot of, uh, how do I check my ego at the door and get better from whatever these results are telling me? Right. And if it worked great, let me double down and figure out how to, you know, get there a little bit quicker, a little bit more efficiently and a little bit more effectively. And if I lost, well, what are the learning, you know, lessons in this process that I can use to what I call weaponize myself, right? I've learned way more from my failures and my losses than I have of all the wins. Right. And so when I look down at my kind of tool belt metaphorically of life and, um, those lessons that I've learned, it's usually been the tools that have been added on there have been from the dark times and the challenging times. You know, I got expelled from high school. I got arrested in college. I, you know, probably wasn't supposed to be successful according to a lot of the people that knew me early on in my life. And yet it was just being curious enough to continue asking quality questions. And based on what my goals were and what I was looking to accomplish, continue believing in myself and just taking action on it every single day and being aware enough to look at and reflect on the results or the data, the feedback that's being given to me and make little adjustments over time. Because when you think about it, you know, whether it's wealth or it's a successful marriage or partnership, business, whatever it may be, the best things are always made in the crock pot. And the crock pot has a lot of different ingredients that take time to come together and create that dish right? Like you can go and put something in the microwave and get it like that. But at the end of the day, it's not really going to be that great. It's not going to be that worthwhile. And I look at that in terms of everything that's worthwhile in my life is I want results and dishes, i.e. in my wealth and my bank account and my business and my marriage and my relationship with my daughters. All of those things are what I want to create in the crock pot, knowing that I took all the necessary time to put all the right ingredients in, I put in the work and I let it have the time that it needed to produce the result that ultimately is required in order to get that outcome. And I think a lot of people, they, they, they want it quick. Don't get me wrong. I'm a millennial. I pace in front of the microwave, right? I want my shit fast, mm -hmm. right? Which we all do. We all want those quick hits of dopamine and gratification and all of that. But at the end of the day, when you think about the best stuff in life, whether it's your wealth, uh, it's a successful business, it's a strong marriage, it's great friendships, whatever it may be, that doesn't come in the microwave. It really is created in the crock pot. And so having that long-term perspective of becoming a millionaire and mind you millionaire in the context nowadays is a million bucks. It's not really that yeah. much. And at the end of the day, the people who have become millionaires will tell you that when they looked at their bank account statement the day before and the day after they became a millionaire, they didn't really feel that much different. Right? So I'm a big believer that money only makes you more of who you already are. And it's just going to give you more of a platform and a spotlight to truly exemplify and enhance those qualities within you. If you're a good person, you're going to use your money and your platform and your brand and your opportunities to go and make an impact and to influence people and to create a better life for yourself and for your family and other things that you're passionate about. And if you're a shitty person, you're just going to find more opportunities to be a shittier person when you have that money as well, right? So I really do think money is absolutely important and it's a very strong tool and resource that every single one of us who has good intentions and has really amazing goals tied to their money 
should 100% chase and go after. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know you can get a free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut, which will show you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. And there's a special link just for this episode in the description. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. And it shouldn't be demonized and it shouldn't be this bad negative thing that oftentimes we've seen and heard for <laughs> many decades and years, whether that was through parents or teachers or grandparents um, or in the media, right? Um, I think, you know, more and more people should aspire to be millionaires, but there is a plan and a path that goes along with that. And there are many different ones that all converge to kind of crossing that threshold milestone, but be open and flexible. And at the same time, know that there are foundational principles um, that are going to help you get there without you having to struggle and learn those things on your own by listening to shows like this. Why is it so hard to do the right things consistently over time? One of my early mentors told me that repetition is the mother of all success. Mm -hmm. The people who have the ability to do the monotonous, boring shit every single day, whether you want to do it or not, right? Because motivation, as many people would agree, is you know garbage, right? It's never there for you when you need it most. Mm -hmm. And so how do you win those conversations up in your own brain that then physically can create a different result and action for you? Um, one of my favorite analogies or acronyms is called point far P T F A R. And, um, ultimately it is your P is your programming, your subconscious mind, right? Um, leads to your T thoughts, your subconscious fuels, your conscious, then your F your thoughts, lead to how you feel about certain things. And based on how you feel about certain things, A will inquire you to act a certain way or not. And then based on those actions or lack of actions thereof leads to your R results. And based on your R, it reaffirms your programming. So when I think about some of the things that I used to hate doing or that I didn't want to do, and I just knew I had to do them, I kind of went back and said, well, what is, what is my programming around this? And why is it this way? Because the beautiful thing about this rhythm and this acronym is that you could break, break the, you know, the link in that cycle and set it on a new track. So if you think about all the areas of your life that maybe you're struggling with or challenged by certain opportunities or activities or commitments or whatever it may be, I'd, I'd encourage people to, you know, think about their brain, their subconscious mind as a filing cabinet that you've been filing shit away in for years and years and years and years. And you really need to take inventory of what's in there. And then how is that serving you? And if it's not, the beauty is you can literally make a change in your life just by making one simple decision that is completely different or opposite than what you have been doing and what has been yielding you those results. So again, I'm a big tweaker and tester. I like to start with something small. Um, what is one simple thing that you can do every single day that swings the pendulum in a different direction? So for a lot of people, right, if it's, I struggle with food, well, then remove all the shit out of your cupboards. That is temptation for you and set yourself up for success. If it's, I need to get better physical exercise in my life, well, what's one thing you can do every day? Go for a 30-minute walk outside, right? So thinking about little things, don't make it so big and so overwhelming just think of small, simple little rhythms that you can do no matter what at a bare minimum. What is that repetition that you can plug into that little things done over an extended period of time turn into big things, right? So 75 days of doing these little things every day, I look up and it actually turned into really big results and momentum in my life physically and mentally. So instead of overwhelming yourself and over committing to all kinds of crazy things that you think you need to do, I like to stack rhythms and habits on top of each other one at a time as you get more consistency with that thing. And then it just becomes part of who you are and what you do. It's kind of like breaking through whatever ceiling you feel like is hanging over your head and making a new, your new floor and your norm of just what you do, how you think, how you act by very simple routines. So I think that's something that people could probably take inventory of and look at habits that aren't serving them and what's one habit that they could incorporate in. Um, but when you look at, you know, anything in terms of going back to the context of the crock pot, 
anything that's worthwhile having is going to be something that is usually probably a pretty simple answer or framework. It's the lack of discipline that people struggle with in order to get those results. And oftentimes that's either the, um, people that they're surrounding themselves with that cat, uh, that create that kind of struggle for them to follow through, or it's the environment. So I'm a big believer in auditing your peer group once a quarter and bulletproofing your environment once a month, because it's very easy for people to integrate themselves into your world that may not be serving you, um, and are actually distracting you or, completely deterring you from doing what you should be doing, or it's something in your environment that found its way in that you could remove and create um, some barriers or what I call the bunker. You know, I, I try and create bunkers and compartments to my life that I know I'm not going to get sniped out of um, and, you know, my head taken off theoretically in terms of staying focused, dialed in and consistent with the stuff that I know I need to. If you want to get to the source, you have to rework your programming. Mm -hmm. And that's hard because programming lives in the subconscious, Yep. which means you can't consciously work on it. But I'm curious for you, two things. One, your programming strikes me as pretty solid. How did you get solid programming? Was it something you were blessed with at a young age? Is it something you worked hard to arrive at? What was that journey? And then also, I guess, part two of the question is, how do you advise people to start doing that work on themselves if their programming's off? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's a, that's a layered topic and conversation. And I think it's, you know, you got to meet people where they're at and there's a lot of layers to that in terms of, you know, whether it's baggage or trauma, who's influenced you, what does your kind of operating system look like now? And why does it look that way? First and foremost, you really have to take inventory of, um, your programming. I'll give you an example. So for me, my programming early on in life, when I was hanging around nine people who like to smoke weed every day and drink and party and not do shit, um, I became the 10th person. And that ultimately really kind of rewired a lot of my programming by being around those people and being in those environments. Um, when I got arrested and I was, you know, facing some actual consequences in jail time, I was so scared of the reality of what my actions and the path I was on had led me to kind of face that I committed to something completely opposite of that and kind of just said, I don't know what it looks like, but I'm going to start taking the steps to go in the opposite direction of what I've been doing, right? So it could be just doing completely different things than you have been doing. But to get a little bit more granular, I would say for me, it's been this awareness. Um, I mean, I've been going to different retreats, different, you know, coaches, I've had, I've had a lot of different spiritual coaches. I've, you know, been in and out of different, um, I would say, you know, religious circles and how that has impacted me. Um, but for me, it was really a lot of, to be completely honest, the psychedelics that I've done over the last 10 yeah. years of my life. I've done a lot of different psychedelics, um, you know, some recreationally just being young and immature and wanting to party. Right. And, and others, as I've gotten older to go, I really am going to do deep rooted work on my mindset, on my soul, based on what it is that I want to become who I envision myself being. So those are some of the things that um, through, you know, studies and coaches and, and just lots of research and then personal experimentation. Um, I don't recommend it for everybody. Um, and at the same time, I can say what you said a little bit earlier that resonated with me was consciously my mind couldn't have done the work without those things. As crazy as that sounds, the psychedelics that allowed me to really tap into subconscious thoughts and programming I would have never even known I had and or been able to work on or consciously think about working on without those things. So it's it's a very interesting, you know, topic to to dig into because um I, it's definitely becoming more mainstream now. I mean, I've done ayahuasca retreats, I've done um acid, I've done, you know, psilocybin mushrooms um in different capacities. And um that's ultimately where a lot of my deep-rooted 
subconscious work has begun um, is identifying blind spots or traumas or things that I never knew I had or baggage that I never knew I was carrying with me. Um, until I had some of those experiences. And you can find those, I think, in different ways without doing psychedelics, but that's just been my personal experience and um, how I've been able to, through that process, the key word here, create awareness. Through awareness, you can create space to actually do the work, right? That awareness creates clarity. The clarity gives you the option to decide what kind of work you want to do from there based on what kind of outcomes you're looking to get. Um, and for a lot of people, it's, you know, getting completely different results than what they've been getting. And, and sometimes that doesn't require anything drastic, but doing something completely different than you've been doing and us being, you know, creatures of habit and, you know, the way nature and nurture are designed for us to not want to do things outside of our comfort zone right now, I've just started to really embrace the conversation in my own head that anytime something to me makes me feel nervous or concerned or the fear of failure or just fear in general comes up, that's usually now, instead of for me being a flight um, response and trigger, it's lean in because there's something good that is going to learn from this. And I don't know if anybody else has felt this in their own life, but you know, outside of like real fear of somebody pointing a gun and you're staring down the barrel, you know, in your face, or there's, you know, a car coming 500 miles an hour at you and it can actually kill you, which most of those scenarios and circumstances are few and far between for most human beings in their lifetime. All of the fears that we create are theoretical. They are all in our minds. And when you go through, cause we all have these scenarios and circumstances in our life where we've been fearful at some point in time, and you decided to push through that fear anyways, and then you got to the other side and you took your pulse and your heart's still beating and your wife's still married to you and your kids still think you're awesome. And you're like, okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Those fears time and time again that you can overcome slowly start to turn into confidence. And so now as I've stacked fear overcome into confidence and then done that again in other scenarios and circumstances of fear overcome turned into confidence. You do that more and more and more. Now, when those things show up, the conversation and the physical engagement with how you navigate those circumstances and situations for me is all right. It's an, it's a, for me, it's a call to adventure now that I know I'm going to learn something about myself. I might fail. But at the same time, I might find some amazing things that completely open up new thoughts or new habits or new relationships or new opportunities in my life that I wouldn't have had otherwise if I decided to run the other, the other direction. That's the beauty of this journey that we're on. It's unique to every single person. And the second you start trying to make your journey exactly like somebody else's is when you mm -hmm. strip yourself away from your own gifts and your own unique abilities and your own superpowers to actually create and uncover all of the amazing experiences that you're going to have and get to enjoy by following your path instead of trying to march down somebody else's exactly the way they did it. A guy that's got nothing. Yeah. Where do you start? And I've thought about this before. Like if I had to totally start over and lost all my resources, do you, do you go sell something and leverage that skill? Do you market something? Do you try offer paid services? Like what, where does a guy start when he's got nothing? When I got to Pueblo, first thing I did was take my hundred dollars. I went to the bank and I got, I gave the hundred to Wells Fargo. And I went to zero five minutes after I was there. Now, the, the, the reason this is important and I hope people get this is because I was no longer managing money and it forced me to go make contacts with people. I was now forced to get shelter, food, and water from mm -hmm. people. You got to remember, not only do I not have money, dude, I don't have a place to sleep tonight. Well, that's consistent with what you teach. I mean, I've been through some of your stuff and you say spend 95% of your time focusing on income and only 5% dealing with expenses. That's what you're saying is eliminate the expense management so you can focus on going and getting what you can. Yeah. So it took me off a of defense. I'm not playing defense now. I'm not trying to, I don't want to be a manager. If you're trying to build a $10 million business, being a manager will cost you your goal. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to build a $10 million business. I'm not trying to manage money. So, you know, as I was thinking about this, this premise, I was thinking like, what would be the hardest thing? And I got it. I'm, I'm guessing for you, but I want, I want your, your take on this, that like the total loss of leverage, like right now, 
you make a phone call, you can have money move. You make a phone call, you can have 100 people scurry about and do your bidding. All of a sudden, you got no leverage. Your time is worth, I don't know, whatever you can get paid washing dishes unless you figure out a way to amplify it and you can't get anything done. How hard was that? How frustrating, how uncomfortable? Well, if you got a $10 million target, you're not going to wash dishes because you just can't, you can't wash enough dishes. So, so, so where so, do you go to, or go the, ahead. The, sorry. Goal, the, goal, the goal put a lot of things out of play. Right. The goal, when you do, when you do the math on, this is why most people don't actually understand the 10 X rule, but when you take a goal, this that's whatever it is, right. You're making 80 grand. You're like, okay, my new goal is going to be 800 grand a year. And you can't even make 80. Like you're having trouble making 80. I get it. You can't save any money. You don't have enough time. You got two kids. Uh, you're fighting with the, your spouse and you, you're like, how am I going to go from 80 to 800? Well, what, what, what I'm saying is you, you can't even figure out how to go to 90. But when I, when I go to 800, you're like, oh, I have to quit my job. Right. I'd have to borrow money. I can't borrow money in this position because I don't have a name. I'm, I'm, I'm an alias. I don't exist. Um, but, but it took dishwashing. See, unfortunately, most people don't take their choices out, right? It, yeah. it, it, I eliminated all the stuff. Uh, Glenn, Glenn sold a truck. He, he, he was flipping trucks. I don't want to flip trucks. I don't want to sell tires. He was selling tires and stuff. I'm not saying that's wrong because he did great. He ended up in a restaurant business. I couldn't end up in a restaurant because of COVID. Yeah. So I, first of all, I got to start eliminating stuff. I need a $10 million business in 90 days. I divide the 90 days into $10 million. And then I say, who's got $10 million? I can't go to the government. I don't exist. I'm not going to go to poor people. They don't have anything to give me. So who am I going to do business? And by the way, you're in Pueblo, Colorado. That doesn't sound like a, a Mecca of industry. Uh, the average person, the average household of Pueblo makes $24,000 a year. The town yeah, is so, so if you make a ten million dollar business in ninety days, you're you're one of the handful of richest guys in Pueblo. I'm I'm a king. Yeah, yeah. So so again, you know I mean, crazy dude. I'll tell you a little thing. I haven't told anybody this. Yeah, yeah. I'm there four days, and I'm in million dollar homes. I'm in the most expensive homes in Pueblo, and I I, I don't think it's going to show. I don't think it's going to show up because Discovery didn't understand it. They're like, "What are you doing, dude?" I'm like, uh. I figured out how to get into two homes, the most expensive homes that are for sale in Pueblo in the first week I was there. I don't think it's going to make the show because I don't think they get it. They don't understand why I was doing that. And the reason between me and you that I was doing that is I wanted to meet the people that are selling those homes. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I mean, in that scenario, and again, I, I, I mean, the show is going to air tomorrow and we can all watch your experience. What I'm trying to extract here is mappable experience because there are some people that's that's not a discover show or discovery show that's actually their life it's real life so so for that guy and and i i get this you know too i get kids and young people and disenfranchised people that are like hey i have this huge goal where do i start and you know they don't have much to work with i'm, I'm how much can you share about your strategy if not your tactics on like how do i go from zero to hero fast yeah so I, I, Go ahead. So those, those people you're talking about, they, they actually don't have a goal. They have a selfish passion. Oh my God, I want to change the record business or I want to do, uh, I have this great idea for blah, blah. But I'm like, dude, but it's not going to ever make any money. Mm -hmm. Like I was so clear. Oh, I want to change the world, but you're broke. You can't change the world if you're broke. It's never been done in the history of the world, including uh, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was not broke. Everybody's like, oh, Mother Teresa never had anything. Mother Teresa is the perfect, the perfect um, example of what I did. Mother Teresa never had any money. She didn't need money because she was connected to people yeah. who would fund her projects. And so unfortunately, the, the kids that you're talking about, they're like, I want to do X, but I'm not willing to give up anything. And I want to get there and, you know, nobody wants to fund that. Right. So, yeah, and so, they haven't developed any skills that offer any value to the people that steward the resources. And, and they want to do it on their own, which no one has ever done in right. the history of the world. Right. Uh, so one little trick is when I went to Pueblo, I wasn't looking to do something on my own. I wasn't even looking to start a new business. 
Mm. My preference, I didn't pull this off, but my preference was to, to literally drop in on a guy that had a business and build it up and get a piece of it. That's so failed. By adding value and yeah, exactly. by being a value multiplier. It, yeah, because if I could, if I could take his company and add a hundred million dollars worth of value and get 10%, I would have, right. I would have gotten a $10 million valuation for my part, my new partnership. So out of the, the myriad of skills that I know you have, because I followed you for a long time, what skills were you going into those situations trying to leverage to add value? In other words, what skills should people be developing that add the most value to going concerns? People, just people, people, skills. people skills, man. You just need to know how to, I need to know how to add value to people's lives, you know? So how, how do I make contact in the first, the first seven days? The only metric I measured for seven days was how many people could I meet? Hmm. And, and were they quality people? Like, I know this is going to sound terrible to a lot of people out there, but like most truth they, does. So go ahead. Yeah, exactly. If they couldn't help me, I didn't spend time with them. Yeah. So, so I know people find that brutal, but look, man, I was raised by a single mother and you know, I watched my mom suffer and I watched her not be connected and never really get ahead. She did all the right. I mean, she, she was a great mom and, she did all the right things, but she never got connected and she never got ahead because of that. So her entire life was spent really scared about money. And I decided when I was 16 years old, I'm like, I am not going to live like this. I am going to figure out how to get mine so that I can take care of mine. And so that maybe I take care of mine. I'm not worried about mine anymore and I can actually take care of others. Um, so you know, there's two other women that are going to do this show. They're going to drop all three of us at the same time. I'm sure they have completely different strategies. I'm sure they're nice people. They're probably phenomenal at pulling heartstrings and making the world feel good. I'll guarantee ain't nobody going to keep up with my results. <laughs> yeah. So, so that said, I mean, are you allowed to tell us how it ends? Yeah, it ends like this. It ends with America under, uh, you know, having a couple of things they walk away with. First of all, America will hate me and some of them are going to hate me and some of them are going to love me, but everybody will look at me and say, dude, that guy did that. That is ridiculous. Second thing people are going to walk away with is they're going to, the idea that you need money to make money will be debunked forever. Mm, nice. Like the thing I'm most proud of in this show is like, you cannot watch this show and ever say that to yourself ever again. And the set, the third thing is, you will never use time as your excuse again, ever, because you're going to see me under a very, very compressed, short period of time. Despite COVID, despite getting sick from altitude sickness twice, and despite being quarantined 14 days, I didn't even use the full 90 days. The environment that that person's living in, environment is food, the basement, friends, radio, music, television, Netflix, um, the refrigerator, your bedroom, your office, um, all of those are environments. Everything is an environment, your mind, your body, all of those things, what you listen to is an environment. And so I'd have to ask that person, what environment are you in that's conditioned you to think, feel, and behave a certain way? Because once you understand that it's your environment that conditions you to think, feel, and behave a certain way, because if you hang out with broke people, you're going to become broke or stay broke. If you hang out with rich people, you're going to start to think a little different like rich people, which is why your podcast is so amazing because they get to sit down and listen to different people who've made certain levels of wealth. So the first thing with anybody who wants to change their result is not to change their behavior because the, the reason why they haven't changed their behavior in the first place is because just changing your behavior is not enough. You can't just change the way you think and feel either you have to change the way that you're conditioned and the way that you're conditioned is in your environments. So you need that guy, Jeff, 12 years ago, needs new friends, needs new things he watches, needs new things he listens to, needs, new, needs a new room. It's probably, it's probably got shit all over the floor. He needs to clean it up so he's organized because when you're organized, you have an organized mind. And when you can be cleared in the mind, you can control how you start to behave a lot easier. When everything's messy and clouded, so are you. And so- you need to go back. You don't just say, hey, Jeff, 
from 12 years ago. Here's a new habit for you to do. Shut up. That's not going to work. For 99% of people, willpower and saying, I'm going to go to the gym. That's not enough. That's why whatever the stat is, 96% of New Year's resolutions fail. Because saying you're going to change the behavior and doing it short term is not enough. And changing how you think and feel, although there's ways you can do it, that's not enough. You need to go to the absolute root cause. How do I get a new result? Well, change the behavior, change the thoughts, change the feelings. How do you do that? Change the conditioning. How do you do that? Change the environment. If I forced you into an environment where I made you the healthiest, best, successful version of you, I couldn't do that just by talking to you. I have to actually change your environment, or I could do it by talking to you, and then you have to change your environment. And the thing that sucks for most people is their environment that they're so attached to is their friends, their family, where they live, and all of that. I've heard all the excuses. Oh, but I live in Mississippi with my parents who are broke, and I can't leave And I'm like, but Mississippi is the reason you're broke and your parents are, but you can't leave, but you want to be successful. Something has to change. And for for me, I was that Jeff 12 years ago and my own version, as many people listening might still be that person. You got to change the environment. You got to change every aspect of your life that is conditioning you to think, feel, and behave the way that you are. And the first thing is usually your friends and your family. And it doesn't mean you have to change them. It just means you have to distance yourself from letting them condition you. Oh, Jeff, don't do that. That's too risky. Don't buy Bitcoin. That's stupid. Don't do, don't go to that seminar. It's a scam. Why are you listening to this Jeff and Mark guy? Those guys are scammers. Those guys are rich douches. No, we're not. We understand we've learned certain things. We've applied them and I get a lot of joy and fulfillment sharing this information because it's changed my life. I used to be the same Jeff in the basement 12 years ago too, in my own version. So I started searching on the internet. How do I become rich? How do I become successful? How do I become confident? How do I become the cool guy? And I started finding Tony Robbins and all these other people. Um, I became obsessed 10, 12, 14 hours a day studying that stuff. I was in the back of the classroom. If I even went, I ditched class a lot of times. I go sit on the beach and look at the mansions and listen to Tony Robbins and all this other stuff and say, I'm going to own those one day. Um, And so I just became obsessed 10, 12, 14 hours a day, calling up seminars, negotiating for me to volunteer, to get in a free ticket. I went to every possible seminar I could go to, um, listen to every possible book, Tens of, I swear, 20 to 25,000 hours of personal development is what I've studied over the last 14 years. Um, just became obsessed like I always do. I'm all in or I'm all out. And, um, and then I, I got to a point where when I graduated college, I was like, I'm either going to go and work for somebody else and be the number one sales guy because that was what I figured. How do you get rich? Become the top sales guy. Um, so I became really good at sales psychology, NLP, neuro linguistic programming. And I was like, I'm going to become the top sales guy at a company or I'm going to start my own business. And so I said, screw it. I'm going to start my own business. So I started my own business. Um, and then on the, so Monday through Friday, I was working on my business when I graduated college, Saturday and Sunday, I'd go fly around the country and even Canada and other countries. And I was the guy who would speak on stages as an MC and sales rep who would go and speak at somebody's seminar and then help sell at the back of the room and and generate, you know, half a million to $2 million in a weekend as the sales rep for some other guy's event. Um, so I did that on the weekend that gave me some additional cash flow to keep reinvesting back into my company to start it, um, failed and struggled miserably for the first like year, then two years I was making it within two years. I was making a quarter million dollars, three years, over half a million, four years, made my first million, five years, multi-millions. And now I'm in my eighth year and, you know, we're doing, we're doing well, (laughs) we're, we're at eight figures. So we're doing pretty good now. Um, and yeah, it's been a wild journey. Man, what a what a crazy story! You you reminded me of of some of the things I was I was going to talk about earlier. You know, it's you described that, and and I would argue I would suggest I don't, I, you're what in your thirties. Yeah, I'll turn thirty one in a couple of days. Okay, I'm forty two, um, and I would I'm I, you you made me think like I wonder how much personal development I've done. I mean, at least 25, 30,000 hours. I mean, just, I still do an hour or two every day. It's like, just of course, in my life. You well, you're, you're also living it. And that's the difference too, right? Is like, you need to do it at first, which means doing it is like studying it and embodying it and being at the seminars and reading the books and listening to the audio tapes so that you can condition yourself for how to unconsciously live personal development. Totally. I'm think I'm thinking, feeling and behaving personal development where before I needed to study it and learn it. Now I'm living it every single day. So, I mean, really 24 hours a day, you add that up. It's like, that's yeah. truly how many hours you got under your belt. Well, I think a lot of it is I'm, I'm, I feel like I live my life 
trying to find the next question mm. so that I can go seek the answer with intention. And I think a lot of living is about actually trying to avoid creating questions. That's mm. how a lot of people live. I love finding a better question. Like when I'm like, and I just think about how I live my life and where my head is at all the time. It's like, how do I, it's not even just how do I solve X problem? It's like, how do I define the problem in even bigger terms so that it'll beg for an even bigger solution? And then, Love it. You know, and, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's like, I think about my inner monologue sometimes. And I, I think you're right. After thousands of hours of listening to you know, every name a personal development person. And I guarantee you, I've listened to them for, for sure hours or more. And it's like, I can't not think that way. And it is, it's so. And that's what you did though, is you change the environment to condition yourself. So you automatically think and feel and behave congruently to achieving the goals that you want. And that's what most people don't get. You are still the same guy who's the same student who knows that you're never, you never made it. You, you and I met at an event where even though we're both, you know, relatively successful, we both make millions of dollars. You and I were both going back to the roots that got us to where we're at, which is investing and being a student first, even though we're both in education as leaders and role models and teachers and consultants, the way that we got here is by investing and being a student. And to, I, I love that you brought that up because you're still that same guy. And as am I, what got us to where we're at is that we're always a student first. You and I both paid seven grand to be in an event. And even though we've known of each other before that, we both really connected in person at that event as a student sitting in the audience of this small little group of successful guys learning from each other. So I just wanted to just pin that because that's so critical that, you know, you've never made it. You always got to go back to the basics and that's being a student. No, it, it's so true. And, and really the best, you know, the best educators are just the best students um, yep. that invite other people to learn along with them. What was your first event like? Brad Sugars is a billionaire and he has this whole, I've got his collection of books right here. Um, he has a whole series of books and it's amazing. It's like, he's, he's a billionaire and he's the guy who taught me. He said this on stage. It was a room full of suit and ties and I was like 18 years old. And he said, how many of you would, if you could make 10 million or hundred million or a billion dollars in the next 10 years, in the next 10 years, you could achieve any business goal, personal goal, financial goal, 10 years. If all you had to do was shovel elephant poop every single day for one hour and everybody's hand shot up. He's like only one hour a day shoveling elephant poop. And at the end of 10 years, you'll have achieved any financial goal you want. And everybody's hand went up. These are all a grown ass adults. I'm 18 years old in the back of the room in a hoodie and a hat. And I'm like, my hands like, Oh, uh, okay. Everyone else's hands up. Um, and these are all grown ass adults with careers and businesses. And this guy's a billionaire asking the question. And then he said, now I got good news. You don't have to actually shovel elephant poop to achieve your goal in 10 years. You just have to replace the hour of shoveling elephant poop with reading a book that will get you closer to the goal. And after 10 years, an hour a day is, you know, 365 hours. And if you do the math, you know, an hour a day at 365 hours ends up being like two full months of uninterrupted work. And then you do that for 10 years, that ends up being um, like two and a half years of like uninterrupted or whatever, almost two years of uninterrupted nonstop every day, grinding to achieve your goals over 10 years. And he goes, you really want to be an overachiever? Read two hours a day, three hours a day, four hours a day. That day I left the room. I started studying 10 to 14 hours a day of books because I said, if it, if that billionaire said I can achieve anything in 10 years, if I read one hour a day, I'll read 10 hours a day. And I've been reading back then I did. I don't need more. I'm running a multi-million dollar company and all these other stuff. Um, I used to read 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, plus audiobooks. I would do nothing. That was all I did. Um, and then I started to dwindle down and now I read about an hour a day. Um, but I used to do 10 to 12 hours a day. And within about five years of him saying that, I became a, a millionaire. And then the next year, a multimillionaire. And, you know, and now it's, you know, 12, 12, 13 years later since that day. Um, but it was all from that advice. An hour a day will pave the way. An hour a day will pave the way. Most people here don't even, don't even listen or read for one hour a day. So of course you're not going to change your life. Yeah. And, and you know, here's the thing, like a lot of people say, yeah, but how do you know, how do you know it's going to work? Like I, if I do <laughs> three months, I haven't seen the result. What, how do I know to keep doing it for another three months or another three years or whatever? Yeah. But you know what? To that same person, I would say, are you spending an hour a day at the gym? 
Because you don't have to wonder if that works. Exactly. So what's your excuse there? And by the way, to the guy that does spend an hour a day at the gym, consistently, religiously, hasn't missed in five years. If that guy says, you, if you had that conversation with that guy, he'd be like, oh, sweet. I'll read an hour a day. No problem. I already go to the gym. In fact, he gets I'll, listen, it. I'll listen to an audio book while I'm at the gym. Like how you do one thing is how you do everything. And if you heard what Mark just said and your resistance just went up and said, yeah, but there's no certainty. I challenge you to say, am I the person who's going, who's getting up an hour early every day, an hour before I was and going to the gym with that hour or doing like, there's going to be some other place in your life where you're also not doing a thing where you don't have to, you can't, you, you can't take the same cop out of lacking certainty because we all know yeah. the gym works. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I mean, I literally think everyone's life will change if they just think of that an hour a day will pave the way one hour a day at the gym or exercise and one way, hour a day of self-development. Google neuroplasticity, Google limbic resonance. You yeah, yeah. will not spend an hour a day inside the thoughts of another person who's more developed and expert in an area that you desire competence, you cannot spend an hour a day inside of their thoughts and not have it change your brain. Any more than you can spend an hour a day in a gym pushing against gravity with weight and not have it change your body. So this idea that, that it lacks certainty, unless you are arguing that limbic resonance and neuroplasticity are not actually things and that all psychology and neurological medicine is just made up hocus pocus, then you can't use that argument here either. Yeah. And the other thing too, on that is you and I both know course junkies and book junkies and education junkies who don't achieve their goals. Like some people do spend an hour at the gym, but they're sitting on the treadmill on their phone. And so they're like, well, I put an hour in at the gym. I'm like, no, I don't know how I, I, I could speak like a sailor if I want, but it's like, I don't know how much that person thinks that they're putting an hour at the gym versus putting in the effort in the hour. And that's the difference I want to make here is two things. One, it's not the time, it's the effort. And so that's a huge one for people to understand is you can't just like haphazardly be on your phone and reading a book. You need to just read the book. You can't be like listening to a podcast, but like doing some other activity that's distracting you from really listening. You can't go to the gym and kind of not really work out. I'm talking about for that one hour, for that one hour, it's just gym time. For that one hour, it's just learning time. That's the difference. You got to put in the actual effort. And then the second thing is, so it's not just doing the habit, it's the effort within the habit. Then the next thing is that um, you were saying, oh, well, what if the person says, oh, what if it doesn't work? If you're already talking yourself out of your goals and your dream life before you've even started on the path, then that's the first thing that needs to change. And again, it goes back to the conditioning and the environment. They're probably around a lot of people who say, oh, don't even get started on that, Jeff, because you know it's probably not going to work out for you. You know the odds of you becoming a millionaire, Jeff? That's like nothing. There's no chance you're going to become it. Don't even, don't even try. Just stay at your job because there's a good chance that in 30 years, you could be a millionaire if you do that. And it's like, no, I could be a multimillionaire in 12 months in today's economy if I just start my own online business or affiliate marketing or e-commerce or whatever. So that person probably is around people conditioning them to think there's no way you'll even achieve that. So don't even try. And that's the first thing right there is they need to be around people like us who help them understand that like the time is going to go by anyways, that, that, which is why most people would rather just say the time's going to go by anyways. I'd rather work at a corporation for 30 years and know that I'm semi guaranteed something where for us, nothing's guaranteed. But I know that if I put the effort in, Karma, law of attraction, the universe, it usually it usually brings to you what it shows you're putting out the effort. Like in the gym, you can't grind for an hour a day in the gym and get fat. If you're eating healthy and you're grinding in the gym, your body is naturally going to get in shape. It's the same thing. If you hang out around rich people, you get to the seminars, you listen to these amazing podcasts like Jeff's here, you read the books, you do the work, you're going to change your life. But again, you can't just try to change your financial situation. You need to change your mindset, your beliefs, your habits, your health. Like going to the gym is not just going to make you feel better and look better. It's going to help you make more money. And that's most people don't get that connection because there are overweight people who are rich, but they're usually also people who struggle in other areas because they're so all in on the money that they're 
making excuses and stories about that. It's okay for me to let my health right. slide and my relationship with my children slide or my relationship with personally slide. I only have business friends and I only make money. Everything else can get put on the side. I believe it's about balance and integration. If you believe in that and having, having it all, I hate to say that and sound like a cliche person, but like you can have it all. You can have amazing relationships an amazing body, mind, spirit connection and be rich. You can have it all, but it doesn't happen on accident. Yeah, there's all, I always say there's only two kinds of rich people. There's people that are rich because they're obsessed with money. And they're the guys that are like, well, that's okay. When my heart fails, I can afford the best surgeon. When my marriage fails, I can <clears throat> afford the best attorney. Like, it's all good because I'm rich. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then there's people that are rich because they're obsessed with excellence. And they have it all. So whenever yeah. somebody tells me they want to make more money, the very first thing we have to decide is, okay, you want to get rich? They're like, yeah, I want to be rich. Cool. Okay, cool. Which kind of rich person do you want to be? Do you want to be a rich person who's obsessed with money or a rich person who's obsessed with excellence? And if you're a rich person who's obsessed with money, you, you'll, you'll probably go through multiple marriages. You'll have failing health. You'll be an asshole. Like nobody want to be around you, but you yeah. will have lots of money. Do you want to be that kind of rich person? They say, no, no, no. Okay. You want to be a rich person who's obsessed with excellence. You're vibrant. You're alive. You have good posture. You speak well. You're, you're energetic. People like you. You bless the world with your abundance and not all this stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to be that kind of rich person. All right. Awesome. Congratulations. You're now that kind of rich person. Just give it some time. The money will show up, but you can start now, right? It, it literally, it just, it can start now. You can, you know, what time are you waking up in the morning? Like, what have you got on your agenda for the day? Like, how much are you going to spend with Netflix versus how much are you going to spend? Yeah. There's a list of a hundred books. Like, that all can start immediately. And then it, and it just, again, adjusted for time, you're already rich. Exactly. That, I love will that. Kind of fill itself in there at the end when the curve goes like this, because it's had enough runway, but like you start yeah. those habits, it's a done deal. And like I was telling you earlier with this sheet of paper here, um, I've already, I've already made $300 million. I'm 30 right now. And I have 20 years but before I'm 50, when the paper says I'll, I'll be worth 300 million in net worth by the age of 50 or sooner, it's already happened. Like I can go back to the Jeff who was in the, you know, the basement 12 years ago, but the Mark version of that. And I remember when I said, all y'all think I'm the dumb kid who doesn't make money, who's, who's stupid and is the least likely to succeed. And, you know, if I can't make it in school, how can I make it in the real world? And I'm telling everybody, oh my gosh, I'm going to be rich. Tony Robbins and all this other stuff is like changing my life. You should study it too. And they're like, how can I listen to a dumb kid who doesn't even know how to do good in school? And I remember saying, someday I'll make more money than all of you. And they were like, oh, no way, no way. And uh, some of those people that I said that to are my homies. And it was just like, you know, guys grabbing each other. Um, and now they work at my company. They, yeah. work, for, they, work, they work with me, right, um, at my company. Um, and it's just the mindset of like, Anything I've set my mind on, I'll be the best, one of the best paintball players in the world. Did it. I'll achieve the biggest prize money in the world. I did it. I'll have a multi-million dollar company in my twenties and be a multi-millionaire in my twenties. Did it. I'll have, you know, an eight figure company by 30. Did it. I'll have $300 million by 50. Did it. And like you just said, it's already happened. The difference is every day I wake up and I'm living, breathing, thinking, attracting, and doing everything I possibly can so that it happens. I'm not saying it's going to happen. And then I'm not thinking, behaving and doing everything to make it happen. And that's where most people mess up is they hear what we're saying and they just think, oh, well, you know, it's going to happen. Um, law of attraction. And there's a lot of people in the woo woo law of attraction space that are out of shape, you know, don't have any money. And they're teaching all this woo woo law of attraction stuff, which I believe the universe does attract to you what you put out, what you think, feel, and behave comes to you. Um, but there's so many parts. Again, we could go for days um, about all this stuff, but there's so many parts where most people drop the ball. They think if I just do the woo-woo law of attraction, it'll come to me. And then they think, oh, but I don't, you know, they're overweight. And they're like, that doesn't have to do with my law of attraction. I'm trying to attract right. this. Right. And it's like, it's like, no, you got to have it all. You, you do have to work on your body, not just to look good and feel good from, you know, oh, it's your ego. No, it's not working on my body affects my relationships, how I think, how I feel, and therefore everything in my entire financial realm. Going back to that, we won't use Jeff, we'll use Mark, that yeah. version of Mark, the undeveloped version of Mark. What's, yeah. and there may be a thousand of him listening right now. Mm -hmm. What's the one thing that you want to say to that, that kid that he needs to hear? I would say, you can become exactly who you want to become. So be extremely clear on who that person's going to be. And then 
just know that you have to put in the work and no one's going to do it for you. It's no one's responsibility. It's nobody's fault except for your own. You will become exactly who you choose. So be extremely clear on who that person's going to be and then work every day to become that person. Do you have an exercise or a process? And I'm guessing you might because you do personal branding work with people. Yeah. Helping that younger version of yourself who may feel muddy, helping him get that clarity. Definitely. So I'll summarize and I'll probably leave some things out um, just for the brevity of the conversation. But basically, I would say, draw a little stick figure of you today and you who you're going to be. It's not about drawing muscles on them or money or anything. Right. It's just literally just stick figures for the sake of stick figures. Um, and then you say now, and you can say, you know, future. Um, now self, future self. And then I want you to write down, how does this person think, feel, and behave on a daily basis? How does your current self think, feel, and behave on a daily basis? What is this person's values? What does this person believe about themselves and what they can accomplish? And what is your current self? Just unbiased, unassociated, disattached. Just think like who, if my dream superhero version of myself, how do they think, feel, behave? What do they value? What do they, what do they do? What do they believe? What are their model of the world versus your current self? And then you'll see the gap. And then obviously the fill in is I need to work every day on learning and conditioning myself to be in the environments to become that person. And there's lots of places to do that. Your podcast is just one of many environments to put them on the journey of who they are now versus who they want to become. And that journey is self-mastery, mastering oneself by getting 1% better in all areas of your life. Mentally, how do I get better mentally? I should read books. I should listen to people's podcasts and audio programs, most of which can be for free if you don't have the money, but you'll usually close the gap faster if you buy somebody's program or go to their seminar or get consulting. Most of the things you want to give you um, the financial help, the life help, the relationship health, most of that is for free scattered across the internet. We live in a beautiful world where almost anything, the how-to to achieve anything is almost on the internet for free. Um, but the how to is broken up in breadcrumbs and it's scattered across the globe. Good luck, good luck piecing it all together, at least in the time frame of which you want, because we're all conditioned to be instantly gratified today and right now. So most people like me are not patient. They want it right now. So if you do have some capital, whatever you got to scrunge together, um, stop spending it on stupid stuff. You don't need another pair of shoes to look cool. You don't need all this other stuff. You don't need a vacation. You don't deserve a vacation yet. Um, save all your money and buy courses, education, a virtual summit, go to stuff like a in-person event if they're doing those right now. Um, but you get the point. Use all your focus, energy, and money on becoming that person. And until you become that person, you don't get the new shoes, the vacation, you don't get to go to the nice restaurant unless as on the journey, you want to reward yourself for making progress, which I believe is important. You don't want to slave yourself until because then you're in the, the pattern of I'll be happy when I'll, I'll only treat myself when and that's a bad pattern to get in. You do want to be grateful and enjoy the journey and be happy now, um, but you want to discipline yourself to put most of your resources towards um, achieving and becoming that person. Um, I believe that you will have every thought, feeling, emotion, relationship, experience when you become the person who naturally has it. Mm -hmm. Just like you and I have everything we probably could have ever dreamed of. And that makes us now complacent because we set the bar so low. Yeah. We've, already, we've already achieved it. And so now we have to raise the bar and set a new goal, whatever that looks like. If it's a philanthropy goal, if it's not finance anymore and lifestyle, then it's philanthropy and making a difference. Whatever it is, we need to keep raising the bar. And so, you know, um, for that person, there's a lot of things you can do. That's a simple exercise, mapping out all your thoughts, feelings, behaviors, values, beliefs, model of the world, which means when I see a rich guy driving, do I go, what a prick? Or do I go... I wonder how he made his money. I wonder what he does with it. And projecting my model of the world is a successful person must have done good things to have achieved that. And hopefully they're using their success for good. At least I know I will. And changing your model of the world from the rich guy or gal, oh, she must've got it from daddy or she must've inherited or so he must've as well. He must've stepped on people's back. That's your model of the world. You're literally telling the universe success is bad. I don't want to be like these successful people. So if that's your model of the world and your beliefs, you need to change that. This guy thinks 
successful people are like this. He believes success equals this. And there's a gap between you and that person. You need to slowly become that person. And if you don't even know what that person thinks, feels, behaves, values, and believes, that's the first thing you need to work on. If you can't even figure out what you should put into those spaces, there's that much more work that you have ahead of you, which really is just education, knowledge, and getting access to the right people who already can show you that. You know, I always wanted to be Tony Robbins, but then I realized I want to embody the language patterns, the confidence, the physiology. I want to, I want to embody the traits and the values and the beliefs that Tony has. I don't want to be Tony. I want his personality traits that anybody can learn to model. You can be an angry person. You can be a happy person. If I'm an angry person, you might be like, I don't want to be like that guy. No, you don't want to be angry. All of us can experience the emotions. So just remember what emotions do you want to have? It's not, Oh, I don't like that person. No, you don't like the way that they're talking. So you don't like their language patterns. You don't like that their language patterns influence you to feel inferior or feel bad. So it's not, you don't like that person. That person might just be having a bad day. So learning to have all these, I call them filters to be aware. That's the first thing you need to do is become aware of how do I think, feel, and behave? What do I value and believe and see the world as? Because that is constantly a repetitive feedback loop that's going to condition me to have the same life or the better life. I can become the guy or I can stay this guy. And it all starts by having a higher level of awareness. So when you think like the old guy, you can quickly filter and say, nope, trigger, eh, eh, eh. I'm thinking like the old me, I need to think like the new me. And so you can start to immediately think, feel, and behave like the new you, and eventually it will become a unconsciously competent, automatic behavior because it's easy to think any way. I could ask you a question and that would lead your mind into a great place, a proud place, a grateful place, or a depressed place, depending on the question I ask you, can lead your mind to a point of focus that'll influence how you feel. And then that could set you the tone for the rest of your day. So knowing to be ultra aware of all of the little triggers throughout the day and then decide through breath, I can bring myself back to a neutral state. So through deep breath, I can bring myself back to a neutral state, have the awareness to change my thoughts, my feelings, and my behavior. So when I see a guy drive by and cut me off in a Ferrari, instead of being like, what a douche, I can and say, that was what the old me would say. The, the new me says this. And I literally, like a robot, would say those conversations to myself. I would go, ah, what did you? And then I go, that's what the old me would say. The new me would say this, and it sounds psychotic, but it conditions you to immediately have a triggered response and awareness that when the old thoughts, feelings, and behaviors kick in, I'm aware through breath, I neutralize myself. And then I get back to thinking and behaving and feeling the way that the new me will until it becomes an automated response. And then you just are living the new version of you who thinks, feels, and behaves, values, believes this. And then all of your wildest relationships, dreams, experiences, finances all come to you. Your real capital base is what you know that helps other people, that helps other businesses, whatever you're trying to help, that no one else in the world knows and can put into action the way you can. That's your capital. What's your tactic for staying in the right space when you are feeling at least financially frustrated? Well, a big part of it is taking care of the body. You know, it just is. I mean, you can't, pretending you're a disembodied mind is, is actual lunacy. It's just not true. Right. <laughs> you mentioned Steve Jobs and LSD. LSD is, you know, a little tiny speck of something with some molecules in it can make you see the world so differently that you probably shouldn't drive right then, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and that didn't go in the mind, it went in the body. And exercise goes in the body, food goes in the body, time spent physically close to other people. These things are all really, really important. And I think one of the problems with entrepreneurship is it tempts us to ignore the body in favor of the outcome and the work. But without the body, we have no foundation and we, our minds will, will go narrow and negative. They just will. It's just what naturally happens. So number one to me is like, how do you exercise? I try to get in four or five hours a day of what I call trotting around. Some of it's very small, some of it's big, but it's moving. I'll take, I'll say what, if I have a choice between a meeting sitting and a meeting moving, I'll take the meeting moving, even if it's not quite as efficient because the body needs it. So that's number one. Number two, I think is regular routines 
that are practiced outside of the job. So one thing I do, and everybody would have different ones, every morning I get up and after I push the button on the coffee machine, I take an apple, I take a chef's knife, I take my cutting board, and I pay attention to how I cut that apple up and put it in two bowls for oatmeal. Why? Because the knife is real, the apple's real. My technique is real. The smell as the, as the blade penetrates the apple, the feel, that special feel, if you've ever done a lot of cooking, you know, where the knife starts to move into whatever you're cutting, that stuff's real. And it grounds you in reality to do something real that's simple and to pay a lot of attention to it. Not do it in a hurry to get it over with. Just not, it's not too big a deal, but little stuff like that to me allows you then when you go to say, hmm, you know, can I solve this problem? Because your real job as an entrepreneur is, isn't the stuff people call work. The stuff they call work, you already know how to do. If you already know how to do it, give it to somebody else. I mean, really, teach it to somebody else and give it to them because your job as an entrepreneur is to figure out what you don't already know that's important. So you've got to get face-to-face -face with problems. I love selling because I think that's the number one way to get face-to-face -face with problems. I think entrepreneurs, CEOs who don't sell, are crippling themselves with regard to the information that could come back from customers before their customers, when they're at their, their least sure, right? When they're the most interesting, when they're gonna say the things you kind of go, really? Because it's obvious to me that you should do this. Obviously, it's not obvious to you. Now I've got to figure out why. Well, what's the why there? And what can I do about that? Do I do it in the product? Do I do it in the pricing? Do I do it in who we're selling to? Do I do it in the messaging? Where, where do I? Where do I address this question of why isn't everybody just running here and jumping on board and writing checks to me, you know? And that's your real job as an entrepreneur. And then on the cost side too, you've got to figure out like, where can I drive some cost to zero so I can get a little infinity in this business? You know, the math says, if I can get a denominator to go to zero, I get some infinity. And a little infinity goes a long way. I tell you that, a little infinity goes a long way in business. So where's a zero cost option that I've ignored? So some of this stuff is just like, if you have frameworks and you evolve them, you believe in them, you, you apply them and apply them not with internal discussions, but primarily talking to customers. I think that it's really easy to make it fun. I tell you, nothing's more fun when a customer suddenly understands what they didn't understand or a prospect does and they decide, I'm with you. That's, that's fun. You don't have to celebrate it like rah, rah, victory. And then one last thing, entrepreneurs often get frustrated enough that they start treating their customers, their prospects like enemies. I'm going to win this one. Yeah. And then they go into it like it's battle. It's like, it's not battle. You're trying to help somebody. Right. You know, that's not battle, right? Yeah. When the doctor is working on you to save your life, he's not fighting you. He yeah. might take a knife and cut you open. But it's not a fight. He's just got to cut you open because it's part of the deal. How would an entrepreneur solve your time management problem? You know, because it wasn't their problem. They wouldn't get frustrated about it. They wouldn't get reactive about it. They wouldn't start being mean to their friends and their family. They would just consultatively assess the problem. And, you know, how do you, how do you develop? Maybe my question is, assuming you agree with me, how do you develop the discipline to approach your own personal problems as an entrepreneur, not as a human being. Well, I love this, this, uh, this distinction, which is an interesting non-distinction, right? The, the inclusion of, the, of your life as, as a human being and your family's life and your circumstances and your personal financial life also, all within the, the construct of that this all has got to be dealt with. It's all got to be solved. And that's why I include the body, because if you forget your body, you'll have problems that dwarf anything about your business. They just, right. you know, yeah. just give it, give it a shot sometime. It's not so great. So I, I think they're, I think successful entrepreneurs are passionate and objective at the same time. And they practice both. They practice the passion so they can be followed because nobody will follow somebody who's not passionate. And they practice the objectivity because otherwise they're just going nowhere. They're just going where their feelings are taking them. Instead of letting the feelings animate other people, they're letting the feelings animate themselves. Mm. 
And the problem is the feelings won't tell you where to go or what to do, but they will tell you what to do. They'll tell you to do something that's probably not the smartest thing in the world right then, right? So objectivity, I think, helps. There's a lot of ways to become object, objective. One is to write stuff down that makes you objective and because you have to read it. One, another is to talk to somebody else. Your best friend as an entrepreneur is a fellow entrepreneur who's not in the same general sphere of business as you. And you only need one. It's just like swimming. Would you send a bunch of kids out in a lake at a Boy Scout camp without a buddy each? No, right. that's craziness. The buddy system keeps people alive, right? Well, you're swimming in a cold lake as an entrepreneur. Why are you doing it alone? And your business partner is not going to make a great peer because there's things you can't say to them. So when you talk about culture and you talk about tacit knowledge and you talk about building a, a, brew, a group of people aligned around the mission and the service in a business, there's almost a family component to that, that the idea that you could just swap parts out is like kind of like saying you could swap members out in a family. Now, yeah, it is. It is. It, and for similar reasons in a family, say you ignore the connection, right? So say the family was synthetic. It was made up of people who were brought together, but they've been together a long time and now they've adapted to each other and they're covering for each other's weaknesses, emotional weaknesses. That's what a team really does, right? We cover for each other's weaknesses. We watch each other's back quite literally because our back is weak when it comes to doing things because we can't see that direction. Right. So you know, it's why partnership is such a big deal. Two people can see everything. One person can never see more than half. And what's going to get you 50% of the times in the part you can't see? So as soon as you go to two, you know, you have magic, right? It's why even animals who are of different species will make friends with each other. If you, this is something I learned as a kid growing up around animals, a horse and a goat can become friends. Why? Because one of them can look one way and the other can look the other way. That's why, huh. and, you know, that's powerful because you're both prey animals. We're all prey animals in business, by the way, every one of us. You can, Talk all you want about being a predator. We're all prey animals. Right? So partnerships are a really big deal. But once you get those adjustments made, that even in a synthetic family, they're no longer simple. And it's like, say the one thing I can do, it, it's one thing that, you know, musically you have some difficulty with is your fingers are really dry and it's hard for you to turn the page on the music when you're playing the piano, even though you're skilled enough to have the time to do it. But when you do it, it's frustrating and it takes you out of your musical head. Right. Yeah. And I turn the page for you. Who puts that in the org chart? It's just we make something fantastic. We could take it public. That's not a bad thing. You know, you're sharing the ownership of the company with a bunch of people. I think it's a hard thing because you're going to be inclined to think you have a new boss, which is your share price. I just think, you know, when we're trying to do something, we should remember as best we can why the firm exists. This is what Drucker taught. Why does the firm exist? Why even have companies? It's to do things for other people that they can't do for themselves at the same level of cost or convenience or risk as you can do with a group that's learned things, that's specialized. It's not a place to aggregate capital and say, oh, I got some machines and now I can interchange this. It's to solve problems for, for folks that can't be solved for themselves. Look at all the stuff we have. Could, could you or I make a simple product like that? Where would you start? I don't even know how to make glass, right? Yeah. I don't know how to turn whatever they turned into this plastic into plastic. I, I, don't, I wouldn't even know where to start. And yet some company turns these out by the millions. So, you know. A dude like me who's gotten to 66 and wants to be able to actually see what's up can do that simple act and solves the problem. Your needs don't, they are not the reason to become an entrepreneur. The market's needs are the reason to become an entrepreneur. And similarly, your needs are not the reason to start a company. Getting rich is not a good reason to start a company because it's not a good reason for a company to exist. Solving a huge exactly. problem could be a great reason for a company. And by the way, if you do that well, you'll probably get filthy rich. But to try to recalibrate people's minds towards service rather than self um, is not, it's not to, to, like, help me out. It's not just a feel good, you know, 
utopian thing I'm saying. It's literally how business works. It's how it's supposed to work anyways. It's how it must work. I mean, that's what's funny about it, right? It, yes, you can fake stuff every once in a while. I hate the phrase fake it till you make it, by the way. Just go ahead and make it as best you can right now and build on it. Right. You don't have to fake anything. There's nothing to be faked. If you're not capable of solving at least one problem for one human being, you probably can't solve you know, a bigger problem or a different kind of problem for thousands or tens of thousands of people. So there's no need to fake anything. It, and once you kind of get that, it's like, well, okay. So what is it that bothers me about the world? So I, I had an opportunity a long time ago to become a physics teacher at my old high school. And that was what I wanted to do. So I, I saw this life vision where I could teach physics in the, in the school year and I could climb mountains and write books the rest of the year. And then I could come back and teach physics again and I would stay interested and interesting and I, you know, it would be great, right? And my physics teacher, um, Carrie Wilcox, she took me aside and she was going to retire. It was kind of a, a conspiracy. She was going to retire and leave them in the lurch and they'd have to hire me. So right. that was the idea. And so, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a pretty good play. And she said, I can't tell you what to do, but I want to tell you what to do. Don't do this. Because I keep track of what I consider to be the entrepreneurial capabilities of every student I've ever had. And you're at the top of my list of all time for 40 years. And I said, that doesn't make sense to me. I have no inclination to start businesses. I don't even know what an entrepreneur is. She says, well, I'm an angel investor. I know because I invest in my former students and others and, and you should go do it. I said, how do you do it? This is Wilcox, how do you do this? And she said, oh, it's simple. Go get a job, a real job in an industry that solves problems of a kind that you're basically interested in having solved. Do that job as best you can. Really put your heart into it, really do it. And do it for the people that you're working with, the, the customers. And at some point, you will be so pissed off at some unsolved problem that you'll actually want to go start a business to solve that problem. Then figure out how to do that in a way that doesn't blow up your life, doesn't destroy your life. And that's all you have to do. She said it's actually simple, but you have to wait till you're that pissed off huh. that the problem's not solved. And they go solve it. The question is, which ones are important? Which ones do you feel like, wow, that could really make a difference? I see all this inventiveness, people coming up with things. And then I see a 95% failure rate to take it to market. So the innovation economy is bottlenecked somewhere. I happen to believe I know where it's bottlenecked, which is in the failure to create a trust relationship with somebody who might avail themselves of that innovation three years from now three years in advance. Waiting, which is a cheap trick, is not really the way to allow the innovation economy to achieve its potential. It's creating trust relationships where somebody gets to the point where they trust somebody with an innovation more than they trust themselves, because that's the expert. They gotta trust them more than they trust themselves, and they'll actually buy it and use it and take advantage of it. So that's why you know we're doing what we're doing at Connect and Sell, because we see this bottleneck on the entire innovation economy, which we all depend on for our future. We all depend on these innovations going to market. And yet business leaders, business you know, executives, people who manage them, run them, invest in them, don't see what we see, which is the bottleneck is the flow rate of discovery meetings with potentially relevant people as early as you can get them. And the foundation for making that flow rate consistent is building trust capital across the whole potential market well in advance of them even wanting to hold a meeting. If you can do those two things, your innovation will go to market. Now you only need the goods and the will. Wow. That's, that's, why, that's why my, I mean, anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'm so glad you articulated that because I struggle. One of my infinite game struggles is finding ways to explain to people what sales really is and why it's not only so essential, but it's actually one of the most beautiful human activities. And you just explained it far better than I ever have. Even the name of your company. Well, I would agree. I, Go ahead. Yeah. 
Well, exactly. You've got the name of the company, Connect and Sell, is, and the tagline, conversations matter. Conversations matter, right? When we have a conversation, think about the, uh, an email exchange compared to a live conversation. So an email exchange, I send you an email. It's got about 5,000 bits of information in it. If the first part of that, say the, the first few words, the first 127 bits, cause you to think something that is not what I meant, what can you do about that as the reader of the email? Nothing, except take that misconception and amplify it through your misunderstanding of the consequences through the rest of the email. Right. right? That's all, it's all you can do. I've reduced you to somebody who can't do what you could do in a conversation, which is say, wait, 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 wait. Are you saying, and ask me for a clarification, right? So the essence of how humans get past their lack of understanding of something, which we must do to, to have anything new happen. We've got to go, I didn't get it, now I get it. Well, how do I get from here to here? We have to go back and forth through this sort of process of I say something because I'm I'm the one who has you know something new and you tell me why I didn't didn't it wasn't enough what I said wasn't enough for you mm -hmm. you stop me in my tracks in fact we have phrases like stop you in your tracks get on the same page we we know how to say things with inflection there's a huge difference between no and no 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 right yeah yeah no right. no no means stop I don't quite get it not no like I disagree with you. Imagine an AI figuring that one out, right? Much less being able to do it in real time, much less being able to do it and be on the other person's side rather than their own. Because when we're in a sales conversation, we must be on the other person's side 100% for a simple reason. We hold all the knowledge power. They know their situation, but we know the new thing. That otherwise, we wouldn't be selling them. So it's kind of bizarre to think I'm going to know the new thing. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it to myself. And then I'm going to use that power over you. And then, oh, we better never see each other again. I call it the tragedy of the crossroads. Sales originally developed as a discipline for a stranger to get the most from another stranger at the lowest cost possible price, while the other stranger gets the highest price and delivers the least value because you're never going to meet again because sales took place at the crossroads. Right. Sales was always where along the Silk Road or whatever, the merchant has their wares, they fake them up, they make them look as pretty as possible, whatever, because you're never going to see them again, mm -hmm. right? And modern sales is the opposite. It's the beginning of a relationship to solve problems, whatever, or a problem or set of problems, kind of forever. It's, an inf it's the beginning of another infinite game. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. Everyone had given up on me. No one was coming to save me. If I wanted to change my life, if I wanted to go on to live my full potential, that I had to make that commitment. And that's exactly what I did.